right yes yes i will do that perfect hold on so mr udit once i say we are live we can begin take a 2 second pause and after that we can begin all right so just wait for my call okay dr jyoti just put this on full screen oh i'll make i'll make it full screen just a minute. uh nikhil has no, no, joined no don't promote not to promote okay okay so mr udit if you want to communicate with me you can put it on chat all right done Okay, I'm taking us live now. Hold on, wait for my call. Mr. Udit, just say one, two, three, four. And it's my request to all the participants that please mute yourself uh, and just unmute yourself when it's time for you. You know, deliver the lecture. Thank you so much. Yes, we are live now. We can begin. A uh, very good evening, everyone, and we are very excited to uh, and very excited and thrilled to once again coming back with very important uh, flagship program of ours for you. My name is Udit Sakuja, and I'm heading the marketing for uh, Dr. Reddy's ortho port ortho orth ortho portfolio and a rheumatology portfolio. And our today's national program will be on the topic of arthroplasty. Uh, next slide, please. just for the housekeeping part so that uh, we run through the overall session in a discipline and a very well timed way i request all the attendees kindly post, post your questions in chat box mentioning the name of respective speaker so that we can take the questions on time and i also request all eminent speakers to uh, make sure that uh, they adhere to the timelines so that we can finish the overall session um, as per the timelines given next slide please talking about the uh, for you as in dr reddy's we keep focusing about disseminating the latest update in any kind of medical uh, knowledge forum is basically a foundation of orthopedic universe meet which we incepted under great leadership of dr kg reddy dr c s yadav sir dr sachin tapasvi sir in 2019 with the current concepts and controversies which was accredited it was a two day full program physical program in hyderabad there are almost 43 faculty 350 plus and attendees 16 hours of sessions in trauma arthroplasty spine arthroscopy and arthrobiologics was taken care of but what happens is we know that world has gone into the covid and we all have become a digital uh, a digital experts to make sure that disseminating knowledge is being taken care of we keep doing the same program the flagship should not go off 2020 we did the same program with cases and techniques we did almost we had 45 faculty 75 plus attendees nine hours of session on trauma arthroplasty and arthroscopy we taking the legacy once again in 2020 now today's program which is on topic of arthroplasty which will have around 14 faculty member and we are expecting 500 plus attendees of that plus after this we will be also conducting our, our trauma and the arthroscopy sessions coming soon now i would really request that this is a very important session to all the major attendees to attend that and get the maximum out of it to make it more leveraging we have in partner with our ortho tv so that we can reach to you know maximum orthopedic fraternity across india so now i hand it over to our medical team dr jyoti to take the program forward over to you dr jyoti please dr jyoti you can uh, uh, start with lot of excitement good evening everyone Ho with whole heartedly i welcome everyone to for today's third forum that is foundation of orthopedic universe meet uh, 
it is a unique and engaging and knowledge exchanging platform for for uh, all the orthopedic consultant it is a amalgamating from bench to bedside so uh, this forum was conducted in two times like in 2019 and 2020 because of covid we couldn't conduct in 2021 now we are conducting in 2022 it is a digital platform it will be wonderful i'm also excited because i i didn't get a chance to attend in 19 and 20 but uh, now i'm over excited to uh, go through all the sessions on cases and techniques today's topic is uh, cases and techniques on orthoplasty so i am going to introduce our chairperson and speakers our chairperson is dr k j reddy and our panelists are dr gagan s sachdev dr y karabanda dr a k yadav dr sanjeev patnayak dr ramesh babu c our eminent our eminent speakers are dr murtaza adi dr darsh goel dr akil arora Dr. Shubhash Jangit, Dr. Pradeep Bosle, Dr. Sudhi Sunil Dajepalli, Dr. Arvind P. Gupta, Dr. Rajiv Anand. Once again, I welcome you all for today's third forum of 2022. So, uh, before starting the session, I want to introduce uh, our chairperson. He is a guiding force for the whole orthopedic fraternity, and is a the universal, slightly. eminent slightly. personality. with a great leadership quality with, a, with under his great uh, Dr. leadership Jyotin, quality move the slide please move the slide with under his great leadership quality we conducted the two forums so i would like to invite our chairperson dr uh, kj reddy uh, kj reddy sir to uh, con- to uh, welcome the other consultants context setting and opening address and and also speak a few words for the newer advances in the orthoplasty dr k j reddy sir he is a ms orthopedics pgi dnb frcs in the edding edinger university frcs ortho he is a chief joint replacement surgeon at apollo hospital jubilee hills hyderabad he is a professor and md at svs medical dental and other institution at mahbub nagar he is a chairman fellowship committee indian orthoplasty association he is a board member of orthoplasty society of asia he is a past president of telangana orthopedic surgery association for in 2016 to 2017 he is a national faculty of avo recon avo trauma indian orthopedic association and he has published numerous articles in national and uh, international journals and also he is a eminent speaker and faculty speaker in national international conferences his specialization and special interest area is joint replacement surgery complex for primary and revi- revision hip and knee sports sports medicine and orthoscopy knee so i would uh, once again welcome dr k j reddy sir uh, to the forum over to you sir thank you very much jyoti for your kind words good afternoon or good evening in india um it's a nice weather today in london um that's what they predicted yesterday it's uh, about 2 degrees outside that's what they say it's a nice weather so we we don't realize when nice things are around we don't uh, um or rather uh, um realize the importance of them i think uh, orthoplasty has evolved over the last 40 years uh, to current stage in a significant uh, manner one thing that revolutionized orthopedics is orthoplasty because in uh, i mean before 70s there was nothing for all these orthopedic patients um when uh, we started among the first uh, totally replacements in uh, pj chandigarh in 1980s um uh, it was uh, it was i think um, a big task probably we used to do once in a month three hour procedure and we used to do bedside when i was as a resident overnight we used to stay with the patient record all the pulse everything and monitor them update my boss every 2 3 hours things have changed when i came to london in uh, 90s 
things have changed significantly. I'm now presently in uh, um, in 2022. Uh, there's so much advancement. It's mainly because revolution in instrumentation. Most of the instrumentation has changed significantly so that we can do minimal incision and a safe procedure. The standard instrumentation is so perfect that we can get results maybe up to 98, 99%. Um, so the newer addition, we have seen computer navigation added, but what happened was it wasn't very helpful. So probably most of us gave up. Now the talk is robotics. I think that's a feature. And I strongly believe there's a big way which will improve or make our surgeries safe as well as long lasting. Even though I think uh, most of the people still think present robotics are still crude, they are not able to, I mean, we can't do entire procedure. We still need uh, our uh, um, standard techniques, um, conventional techniques uh, to complement uh, the robotic surgery. So now we have a great agenda with uh, well, well knowledge, well distinguished uh, faculty from across the India to talk about case-based discussion, which will be more useful rather than a formal lecture. So they're going to show us cases, results, and tips and tricks, how to deal when you deal with a difficult case. And I would uh, request all the audience to involve actively. This is mainly meant for the audience. So you must participate actively. There is a question box. There is a chat box. So you can, after each session, we will discuss your questions. So kindly put a question along with your name so that we can discuss. And I welcome all the faculty. Good afternoon to everyone. And all. it's a pleasure to be associated with Ready Labs. They are so much into education. I've been involved for so many years. And I mean, they're a fantastic team. Um, they've done so many programs. The first program in Hyderabad was uh, super with Hyderabad, Hyderabad biryani. We are missing. And we had great, uh, used to have great dinners. Hopefully, Udit, next year probably we should have a physical meeting in Hyderabad. To 100%, taste, sir. Taste, taste Hyderabad biryani to everybody. 100%. And, uh, with that, I think uh, we will start off the session. I won't take much time. And the first speaker is uh, Murtaza Adib. He is going to talk about total hip replacement in dysplastic hips. Dr. Murtaza. Yeah, Dr. Jyoti, if you just start with the introduction. Hi, good evening. Doctor. Yeah, Murtaza, just hold on a minute. They will put your uh, biodata slide. Sure. And this is to all the speakers. So before you start up, there will be a slide of your uh, brief uh, biodata. Jyoti, you unmute yourself and uh, yeah. unmute yourself. Jyoti, can you unmute yourself? She is not listening to me. I, do, do, Dr. Jyoti, are you there? Or I, Dr. Yeah, Mustaza Abdeep, sir, has done MBBS, MRCS, Diplomo, SNDM, MFSEM at UK, FRCS uh, Edinburgh, Ortho, FRCS at England. He's a consultant orthopedic and joint replacement surgeon at Inmadar Hospital and Advanced Bone Care Clinic at Pune. He is an international surgical advisor to Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh. He is an examiner for MRCS exam conducted by RCS England. Trained in UK for 11 years surgical training from Oxford, Nenari and Northwest TMS regions. Post FRCS fellowship in complex primary and revision orthoplasty. He is a regular speaker in international and national platform on orthoplasty. He has a numerous publication and presentation, done some important publication on the topic like fracture around the knee, median nerve injury, following close manipul manipulation of fracture, mid-shaft radius, total elbow replacement in patient with juvenile idiopathic characteristics and, and orthoscopy guidelines. Welcome once again, sir. Uh, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jyoti. 
and good evening to everybody uh, especially uh, the staff at dr reddy's and uh, dr kj reddy as well i think i'm going to hold you to that uh, biryani next year so you know i i don't forget these kind of things <laughs> especially if it's food okay uh i'll just start how do i i just screen share now yes i can share screen yeah yep. ah, so you can share your screen yep uh okay yeah can you see that please yeah we are able to see it sir. yes fine, fine. so basically uh, i'll be talking about uh, total hip replacement in uh, dysplastic hips um i can't uh, just give a click on the presentation marks acha acha yeah basically with just a brief introduction to uh, ddh development dysplasia of the hip uh, as probably everybody is aware this is a congenital condition it is best detected and managed uh, actually at birth uh, a lot of countries actually have a good screening program uh, which is ideal unfortunately i don't think we have that in india but uh, if that is picked up early they can all be managed quite conservatively and you would not really expect patients to come to people like us for uh, hip replacement in the future few patients definitely um unfortunately if this condition is missed or not managed appropriately uh, during the initial stages then uh, the patient will develop secondary osteoarthritis as an adult and will uh, present to somebody like uh, us basically what are the indications for surgery as an adult with ddh so the first indication obviously is significant uh, hip pain due to secondary osteoarthritis uh associate uh, leg length and discrepancy which can also be quite uh, debilitating kind of condition um especially with a limping short leg uh, painful gait uh, a lot of these patients also develop uh, significant back problems compensatory lordosis of the spine and also some issues with pelvic uh, obliquity and lastly it, there there is also an aesthetic element to it and lot of these patients tend to be quite young and it's difficult to sort of manage you know with the bad posture etc what are the surgical options uh, there are various surgical options i'm just going to discuss broadly uh, so there are various kinds of osteotomies that are done initially obviously for ddh uh, but we won't be discussing those uh, we are discussing patients with uh, end stage sort of arthritis in a sense so uh, basically one option uh, is a pelvic support osteotomy uh, which used to be done quite often in the past uh, there is some room for uh, arthroscopy as well and lastly the topic that we will discuss in detail is a total hip replacement so just uh, looking at these other options before we go into thr first thing that i mentioned is a pelvic support osteotomy uh, this is actually done more so as a salvage procedure it's not done very often these days and uh, these are slides courtesy of my good friend dr ranade who is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon in pune and is usually reserved for patients uh, where hip placement may not be possible for technical reasons for fitness reasons etc and also maybe for you know as per you know patient choice and uh, this is a two level femoral osteotomy um the proximal femoral osteotomy is basically an abduction osteotomy with uh, extension osteotomy the second is like an adduction osteotomy with the derotation of the femur and uh, it has really good cosmetic uh, results and also get rid, uh, gets rid of uh, uh, the painful gait and the tunnel bulk gait as such and this is what uh, it would look like this is a post op uh, result of the same patient as you can see the osteotomy uh, sites have, uh, have fused quite well and the posture of the patient is quite improved uh, the second operation that i mentioned again briefly is arthroscopy there is a role for early onset oa uh there is a role for debridement though the results are not very uh, you know not are sort of in conclusive i would say but it can help in some patients especially patients with labral tears i think there is definitely a role of arthroscopy for such patients and there is a limited role uh, of arthroscopy if there is infection if uh, uh, arthroscopic infection is or uh, yeah, sorry arthroscopic debridement washout is 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 needed then it may be an option now coming to at hr in ddh uh, there are quite a few uh, points that we need to consider and it might be a little repetitive but just to this is just to reinforce the points really so the first thing that you are dealing with is complex anatomy so the main problem i mean the problem is obviously in both the acetabulum and the femur so as far as the acetabulum goes you have a deficient acetabulum 
particularly anteriorly, medially, and superiorly. There are a lot of version issues. You can get retroversion. In some cases, you can get antiversion as well. And there is also a chance of a neovascular where the uh, uh, femoral head is high riding, and you get the formation of a neovascular, as it were, superiorly. Uh, with regards to the femur, uh, there is usually increased antiversion. The neck is shorter. The head is quite deformed, usually elliptical, and uh, the canal size is also quite uh, is decreased as well. With this, you also have soft tissue problems, uh, particularly uh, you have adduction contractures, you have uh, flexion contractures, etc. And when you do the surgery, obviously these need to be addressed as well. So there's a lot of soft tissue tensioning that goes into this operation. And lastly, you have uh, limb length issues, usually shortening, significant shortening, and you need to address that as well. Basically, how do you classify DDH? There are three classification systems I'm going to discuss. The most uh, common one that we use is the Crohn's classification, uh, which basically goes from one to four, and it depends upon the proximal displacement uh, and uh, the subluxation of the femoral head. Um, the second classification is uh, Harto Philakidis classification. The name is quite complicated, but actually it's a simpler classification. Um, it goes ABC, uh, dysplasia, load dislocation, high dislocation. And there is another classification which is, I think, more uh, modern and probably more comprehensive. It is called the Gaston classification. And in this, he has basically classified uh, two separate systems in the same, two, two sections of it. The first section is for astribulum, the second is for femur. And he also considers uh, previous surgical intervention, which is quite important because a lot of these patients have had previous surgical intervention and also uh, the fact that a lot of them have a metal in situ. Uh, you can look at these classifications in the detail. It's all available online, so I'm not going to go into too much detail with this. So what, how do you start off? So obviously, you need to assess the patient clinically, and that is very important, obviously. And then what investigations do you need? Um, you need standard x-rays as well as you need some kind of special x-rays, oblique views, etc. A CT scan is very useful to look at bone uh, morphology uh, with the 3D reconstruction to look at the thickness of uh, you know how much bone stock you have on the acetabulum. Also, the femur, very important to look at the femur carefully in terms of version, in terms of the canal, etc. A scanogram is very useful to assess the limb length issues. And lastly, if you are suspecting that there are nerve, uh, uh, comp nerve compromise issues, then obviously get nerve conduction studies done pre-op. Uh, these obviously are useful to, for you to make a decision and also very useful in terms of uh, medical legal reasons. Um, I just sort of mentioned that we often I also get MRIs done. I've not mentioned it on this. Uh, the reason being that uh, if they've had previous surgery, uh, the MRI is quite useful to rule out uh, any kind of underlying infection. So I, I didn't mention that, but an MRI also is indicated in some cases. How do you start your op? Um, I think you watch Pushpa, I think, to start up the surgery. Uh, I used to quote, uh, you know, watch Rajnikanth movies, but I think this guy has now taken over the mantle. So, you know, the kind of confidence this guy will give you, I think uh, it's unmatched. So, <laughs> so well, before surgery, watch this movie. Okay. Right. So, what kind of things you need to consider? Um, you need to first confirm the astabular position. You need to estimate astabular bone stock. You need to figure out uh, the subluxation of the femoral head, uh, the, the degree of subluxation of the femoral head. You need to measure the combined antiversion. So you need to look at the antiversion or the version of the of the uh, astabulum and the version of the femoral head. Uh, sorry, the proximal femur, and then work out a com combined antiversion kind of angle. You need to sort of try and predict uh, the prosthesis size to some extent. Uh, I usually sit with the radiologist when I send these patients for the CT uh, and I go through the scans quite carefully and they're quite good at giving you measurements of, you know, of the, you know, the, the width of the astrium, for example, the size of the head and the femoral canal size I found it quite useful because, you know, you have to plan these things. Uh, some of these uh, can be quite narrow canals and you may not have the right implant. So you need to get these values quite uh, clearly before you start operating. And obviously, you need to obviously assess the LLD quite carefully. 
Uh, it can be uh, partly functional. It can be partly bony. You need to work that out because there is a lot of pelvic obliquity. There is uh, low doses of the spine, etc. So you need to work out exactly the exact uh, limb length discrepancy before you start the surgery. Technical considerations. Um, uh, the first thing, obviously, is exposure. I would recommend, obviously, the posterior approach. I think most people would do that. Uh, the reason being that this is an extensile approach. You can uh, open it distally. You can open it proximally. It gives you, you know, good access to uh, to do your releases, particularly, uh, you know, the the, fl the flexion deformity releases, etc. And uh, to do your osteotomies. So definitely, that's the approach I would okay, recommend. Just to remind you, one more minute left for you. Sure. And uh, then you need to consider if there is any metal in situ. You need to obviously do trochanteric osteotomies if there is shortening. You need to assess as to the defects, the cup placement. Uh, you may require a modular femoral implant and you need to basically consider limb length correction. Implants uh, in the civil side, you can. You need to keep full area of implants. You need revision cups, stitches, augments, bone graft, etc. On the femur, you need to have both cemented, uncemented, usually uncemented, uh, used more often. Module long stems and circular wires. And complications are quite high in this group. Static nerve palsy is a 5 to 10 percent, dislocation 5 to 10 percent. There's also incidence of periprosthetic fractures and also a risk of infection. I'll quickly just discuss two cases and I'm done. And the first case is a 19 year old female. History was not very clear. She presented to me with problems with the left hip since birth, uh, multiple surgeries. Again, the detail, details are not clear. This was an international patient. And this is what she came to me with. You can see that this is uh, she's had a uh, very shallow acetabulum. The head uh, doesn't exist. It's probably been excised at some previous surgery, and there is significant shortening. Basically, this, you know, uh, we first tried to figure out what, what really was going on. Thesis, I think, probably. I think Sorry? the result because the old yeah. time running short. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that would be nice. This is. Yeah, this is what I did. I managed to get soft tissue correction, uh, do a limb length uh, correction as well. The second case is a 52-year-old lady. Uh, she presented with left hip dislocated at birth. She had uh, pelvic osteotomy at age 5. Uh, this is her uh, x-ray at age 5. She had a pelvic osteotomy. This is x-ray at age 12. This is x-ray at age 43. And this is when she presented at age uh, 52. So I did uh, both her hip replacements, uh, I think with uh, probably two, three weeks gap in between. And these are CT scans of the same patient. And this is her uh, operative x-ray for the left hip. You can see there is a defect uh, superior laterally, which I've done a bone graft. I've used the own, uh, her own head with some screws. This is a post-op x-ray. Uh, sir, if you don't mind, 10 minutes is crossed, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm done. Okay. So it basically, just it's a little key to discuss with your colleagues, work as a team, keep all implant options available, and don't promise uh, the moon to the patient. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful, wonderful cases. I would request all the faculty, because we all know, I, I know it's nice to discuss the theory classification, but uh, it would be more if we spend more time in case discussion. Present a case. What about the problem in that case? How you dealt with? If any problems, how you corrected intraoperatively and how to recognize intraoperative? We have to give tips to the audience, case-based discussion. So you know, any, any, any problems you can encounter, how to prevent it postoperatively, what are things you look for? Brief. I think uh, eight minutes you should stop, not 10 minutes, so that we'll have time for discussion. Next one is uh, invite Dr. Uh, Dr. Dars Goyal. He's going to discuss case on uh, total knee in a severe virus. Dr. Reddy, are we going to have a discussion or question answer? At the end of end of session. Okay. Uh, welcome, Dr. Dash Goel. He's MBBS, MS, MCH, orthopedic gold medalist. He's a consultant orthopedic and joint replacement surgeon at VPS Rockland Hospital and Dr. Goel's uh, Bone and Joint Center at Janakpuri, New Delhi. He uh, is a consultant, joint replacement and orthoscopy surgeon, FJRS, New York, USA and UK, Stanford and USA. Uh, he has done USA Ranwat Fellowship uh, at New York and he has also done fellowship at uh, Munich, Germany. He has been author in orthopedic review for undergraduate, he has done his fellowship and advanced training in nine subjects through major uh, institute worldwide. He has numerous uh, publication and presentation 
uh, articles like meta analysis of randomized control trial involving anterior shoulder instability and complication in the management of closed high energy proximal tibial uh, plateau fractures uh, two pelvic digits on the same side double trouble these are the articles he has presented uh, articles uh, so he has uh, presented uh, over to you sir for the case discussion yeah now that if you finish 10 minutes we'll have two minute discussion for you sure. those who are on because we don't have time for discussion here yeah, yeah. can you so please allow those can you, who yeah. do more time we will have more discussion on it sure yeah. can you please allow my screen share please yeah you can can share the screen now All right. So uh, I will uh, first of all say good evening to all the faculty members and the speakers with eminent faculty like Dr. K J Reddy and Dr. Yadinder Prabhata. So my name is Dr. Darsh Goyal. So today we will uh, talk about uh, one interesting case. So the topic is total knee arthroplasty in severe varus knee. Is it still a challenge in 2022? So directly coming over to the case because I just want to convey. how i felt before proceeding about this case and how i prepared about this case and how we went upon to give a good result to the patient so my patient is 80 years old female with bilateral severe osteoarthritis since 30 years she is a chronic arthritis disease patient with a ptca 5 years ago patient has a chronic kidney disease on treatment she is on controlled diabetes she was bedridden since 3 years and she has severe osteoporosis with a t score of minus 3.8 So I, uh, the X-ray is little hazy, but we can uh, make out that she had a severe varus deformity with bilateral deformity with the uh, tibial subluxation. So here, just to uh, give you a brief idea, how the it was the gait of the patient. She had a varus thrusting when she walked. so uh, sometimes the deformity can be so uh, extreme that definitely it can be a uh, uphill task for the surgeon also the so varus was around 45 to 55 degrees and the fixed flexion deformity was around 30 degrees in this case so initial thoughts and questions i had lot of questions uh, how to proceed about this case the first and most important question was whether my patient is highly motivated before going for any surgery especially like this definitely uh, when the rehabilitation is prolonged and an uphill task for the patient also and does the patient have the required support from the family members and the financial support to go ahead with the surgery definitely it was not a fast track rehabilitation and i kept on remembering one word from the patient when she started saying that she had forgotten how to walk since uh, from 3 years she was bedridden so initial thought was like uh, because of her comorbidities whether i should go for a simultaneous or a stage total knee replacement the only issue with the stage was that i have a feeling that when one knee will be straight the other will be having a such an extreme deformity her gait will be like a d shaped alphabet and how she will cope up and whether she will get motivated after one surgery to go ahead with the second surgery so these were the initial thoughts which i had whether i should go for a tourniquet or without tourniquet in this case whether i should follow another approach or should i go ahead with the standard tried and tested medial parapetalar approach whether i should go for a primary knee or a constrained knee so i made a plan and i tried to do as much counseling with the uh, future probabilities to the patient and the patient got highly motivated and through proper counseling i told the patient how the rehabilitation will be and how the future is going to be and definitely there should be a team effort from the family members also so as far as simultaneous was the stage was concerned because of the so many comorbidities i went ahead with the stage but for tourniquet i wanted to use it as a selective use only during cementation so normally i use tourniquet in most of my cases but before this case i specially did two three cases without the tourniquet just to buck up my confidence to do this case without tourniquet because of our so much associated comorbidities and i knew That the surgery is going to take uh, longer time than usual. 
So coming to the primary versus constraint, I had full backup of both primary and constraint, and I went ahead with the workhorse medial parabolic approach and didn't want to try something new in this case. So the algorithm plan was to create a medial subperiosteal sleeve, removing the osteophytes, taking conservative cuts, keep on rechecking the gaps again and again. And I, I had uh, in my mind that I will have to release the semi-membranous and the posterior oblique ligament also. Posterior middle reduction osteotomy with lateral shift and resect. And if required, I may go for pie crusting also. So in the medial exposure, using a scalpel subperiosteal elevation was done and it included a joint capsule and the deep MCL. Periosteal elevator was used till the uh, metaphysal flare of the tibia. Extensive osteophytes were present and definitely we removed all the osteophytes from the fever and tibia to relax the tented MCL and the medial soft tissue stain. So in routinely also, I'm uh, mostly using the PS knees, but uh, it's a personal preference whether to go for a PCL resection or not. But my criteria was since it was severe virus with flexion contracture, PCL was definitely resected for flexion gap balancing. So I went with the conservative bone cuts, uh, but I was ready to take additional cuts later on, but didn't want that the knee should gap up a lot because of the soft tissue releases associated. So semi membranous and posterior oblique ligament, so uh, they were both uh, released subaerosically. So I had to do a 180 degree uh, skeletonization of the tibia from front to back uh, to balance the knee. So I performed a posterior medial reduction osteotomy also with the lateral shift of the tibial component, which helped to gap upon open the medial side for a good uh, gap balancing. And approximately, uh, as a study done by uh, Dr. Mullaji, 2 mm is required for every one degree correction of the various deformity. I also required pie crusting. I um, got this uh, beautiful technique from Dr. Krabanda, who is a panelist here. He's a very fine surgeon. And uh, I use this mnemonic, which I got from an article that uh, when we release the anterior fibers, it is for flexion. And when we release the posterior fibers, it is for extension. So I usually use a, a 18 mm a gauze needle on a syringe and uh, do the pipe thrusting every three to five mm apart from anterior to posterior and from proximal to distal. So every five to 10 punctures, we reassess the knee. In this case, around 18 to 20 punctures are used. So there was a tibial defect also, but since it was less than 5 mm, I used only a single screw, which was bone cement with screw augmentation technique. So the components, I could get away with the primary components only with a femoroxenium 5 size, insert was only 11 mm. And uh, I had to use a 12 mm into 150 mm slotted uh, uncemented tibial stem. So these are the components which I used for the patient. And the final balancing was with the complete correction of the deformities with balancing around 2 mm later and 1 mm medial with good patellar tracking. So I think, uh, you have two, two more minutes left. Yes. So I would uh, request you to. So this was the final radiograph. Uh, we can see that we have used the primary implants uh, with a uh, good alignment. And this is the final corner after the second stage uh, knee replacement also after one year. So finally, coming back to the question whether it is still a challenge, as Dr. K. G. Reddy said, there's a lot of advancement in the instrumentation and so I, in my opinion, definitely it's always challenging when we encounter extreme varus and osteoporosis. But the recent advances in operating techniques and implant designs, we can de definitely uh, take up this challenge in a more confidently way and with excellent results and predictable results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, especially for sticking to trying. Uh, we will have a couple of questions. If you unshare uh, screen, I think, uh, I think that was an excellent case to demonstrate. I was... Uh, giving a talk in London, King's College, a uh, couple of days ago, I showed a similar case and asked them, how would you deal with this? 100% said, hinge knee. And that's what the opinion of Europeans and uh, generally the people who worked in UK, they know a severe deformities, they straight away go for a hinge knee. Yeah. But because of experience we have, 
And probably we don't know the long-term results yet because our follow-up uh, probably not up to that uh, level. Um, we still manage with uh, constraint, um, I mean, so, um, minimal constraint or ps &E, sometimes uh, uh, maybe um, TC3 um, inserts. Uh, but I think uh, it, it is experience. Experience, we don't know the long-term results, how they're going to do. But definitely hinge knee will not do as good as uh, semi-constrained knee or unconstrained knee. That was wonderful. Um, and the, how would you decide? I think you, I quite like to what you said. Staged release of yeah. any knee deformity because very, very important. If you release all of together, then you left with uh, nothing and a, a minimal cuts on that side. So what is the key point in a severe various knee which, which you would like to pass on to the audience? So I think um, uh, definitely I completely agree with your views also. What I like to do is I like to keep on rechecking the balancing every time. I don't want to do two steps and then check the balancing, you know. Yeah. So there is no ego in doing three, uh, three procedures and then doing for the balancing. After every balancing act, you have to keep on checking whether you are mm -hmm. done or not. And we don't have to go for the another step. So pie crusting was what I did, thought that I will have to do in this case. But I went for it and then only I got the very nice balancing. So I think keep on rechecking is the only message we have to do in such cases. And there should be no time limit. We should try to do it without tourniquet so that we can get on to a good result. But it should be with a full backup also. In case we need something, we should have a full backup. And the last question, because there's no question. Last question, how would you decide to do a staged or single sitting? Do you have any scientific uh, evidence? To support you? Yeah, actually, there have been a lot of studies uh, uh, on this uh, topic and it's a controversy remains. But I think my, um, um, uh, moreover, I, which I follow the rules is that if it is more than 70 with yeah, comorbidities and with the very grave deformities, which I know it is going to take a lot of time, I mostly go for a single knee. I plainly say to the patient that I don't want you to be in the 2% complication rate. Let us go for a staged knee. So uh, in UK, I think most of the, uh, they are doing staged. In US, they are doing mixed. In India, it is mostly bilaterals. Yes, but so I think we have to individualize to the patient. Right. Yeah. If, yeah. if it is, yeah. let's say, as a rule of thumb, if it is more than 70, we will discuss at the end of this one. More than 70, I would be very likely to do uh, simultaneous. Definitely. And the staged means it doesn't really mean wait for six months. Maybe yeah. second day, we give one day gap and see how they recover, how the pain and uh, we can do it. But even if you leave it after six weeks, the idea is you should do on a day two or after six weeks. Don't do it uh, in between because the complication rate is very high. Yeah. And most of the time you leave six weeks, they'll come back. If yes, you do a good job, they will come back. Because most come back they, the, me, they, they will come back. My threshold is three months. I take 12 weeks. Yeah, yeah. After six weeks, after six weeks, we must wait minimum six weeks. Yeah. Yeah, so think, there is a question. Good, How yeah. did you overcome the proximal migration? Any gluteal releases from Dr. Sunil sir to everyone? Yeah, yeah. That is, I think, uh, madam, madam. That was the question for the previous initial one, we will, speaker. We will, questions, I think, Dr. Uh, Jyoti, we will leave it the end. Okay. Not okay, okay sir. Okay. Yeah. Dash, can I ask you one question? Yeah, please, please, sir. Please, uh, yes. First of all, a very illustrious and excellent presentation. Um, you. You, I'm seeing you evolving in a very fine surgeon. Uh, 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 the first cut that you take tibia, yeah, such deformities. How much did you take the cut? So, you, sir, yeah, sir. actually, um, I had a lot of defect on the medial side, so I just went uh, for the lateral side, and I took only a uh, three mm cut from the lateral side. Yeah, that's that the only cut I put to it because I was ready to go for another cut. And, and, even after, and even after three millimeter cut, you have put something like twelve or fifteen. 12 or 15 millimeter insert. I use 11 mm insert in this. Case. 11, yeah. So yeah. you can imagine that if you had taken 8 millimeter standard, yeah. you that probably is. would have been ending up uh, putting an 18 millimeter or sometimes even more, which you don't have in a normal knee. And then you may have to have used a, a TC3 or something like that. Definitely. So, so yeah. That's a, that's a message you should give to everybody that. Uh, you know, the initial cut should always be in such deformity, should always be very, very conservative. conservative. And it should not be. Because scary. what happens, is, I think, uh, Dr. Karpan, as you rightly said, even, they, even though we say we only replace the amount of tibia, we take it. But it's not true because 
In Indian knee, especially, there is osteoporosis. The, the gap is more. Most of the knees are lax. Unlike in uh, European knees, European knees are very tight. tight. Indian knees are very really lax. Even if you take eight millimeters, you have to replace with nine or ten sometimes. So you are absolutely right. We should take as minimal as possible. And sir, you never know when we remove the osteophytes. Sometimes yeah. the knee just opens up so much. Oh, we, we just can't imagine how much the knee has opened up. I think we will invite. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Das. That was wonderful. Thank I would you. like to invite the next speaker, Dr. Uh, Akhil Arora. He's going to discuss cases in orthoplasty. I would request you again. One good case. Discussion would be better rather than 10 cases with no message. One case with a good message is better than 10 cases. Okay. Jyoti, can you just put yes. uh, Dr. Akhila Kuroda, Aroda, sir? One second. Yeah. Yeah, you can put full screen, Jyoti. And yeah. one minute a time for you is one okay. minute for all the faculty. Sir. Welcome, Dr. Akhil Arora, sir. He has done MBBS, MS, ortho joint replacement surgery, Medispare indoor. He has performed more than 100 cases on knee and hip replacement surgeries. Uh, sorry, there is something interrupting. He is a gold medalist in paper presentation and uh, that is hemi-orthoplasty for unstable intertrochanteric fracture in elderly. He has numerous publication and presentation. Pub, uh, articles like uh, retrospective study of role of uh, calcar femoral in unstable intertrochanteric fractures. Welcome to you, sir. Anil Arora, what would be nice if you stop at seven, eight minutes, we'll have a good discussion. Yeah. Yeah, just yes, click on the on the slide if you come. Just click on the on the, on the. the click on the screen, so yeah. Screen, just click on the screen, it will get forward. No, no, take this one out. Click on mm -hmm. the screen. Just and stop on the screen. So stop sharing mouse. and oh, yes. yeah. Okay, fine. Are you able to see my screen now? Yeah, yeah, very much. Yes, very much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, seniors and colleagues. I'm Dr. Akhil Aura, joint replacement surgeon in Dor. Uh, so in uh, coming few weeks, I'll be coming with uh, QVIS robot. So I'll share my cases uh, regarding this uh, robo machine. So now I'll be presenting few interesting cases. Uh, my case number one, a 45 year old male patient. He came in OPD with chief complaints of pain in right knee, difficulty in walking. He had a history of operating, uh, he had an operation for right distal femoral fracture five years back. So this was his gait when he come to me. On examination, there was laxity both in medial and lateral side. Yeah, and this was the preoperatively uh, preoperative x-ray. In this x-ray, we were able to see there is a malunion of lateral femoral condyle. And secondary osteoarthritis, right knee. There was no signs of infection. I checked for all the blood parameters. There was no local rise of temperature. I opted for uh, primary total knee replacement along with the implant removal. This is the post-operative X-ray. I removed all the three screws. I I was able to go ahead with a primary total knee. The knee is quite stable. And this is the post-operative movement patient is walking comfortably there is no laxity whatsoever so this is the reference to my case another case uh, a six-year-old male patient came in opd with chief complaints of pain in left knee difficulty in walking he had a history of compound comminuted fracture in proximal tibia along with segmental fibula fracture he was operated two years ago this was the preoperative x-ray. There was a malunited proximal tibia fracture. There was rush nail done elsewhere. And this was the postoperative x-ray. I used the stem extension with an offset in this. As you can see, implant is rightly in position. There is no laxity. Everything is in position. This was the postoperative video. Patient is walking comfortably.
This is the reference to my case. Another case. This is the most interesting one. A 36-year-old female patient came in OPD with pain in right knee, difficulty in walking, and there was restricted movement at right knee. Now, this was the pre-operative X-ray when she came to me. The previous history. This was initial state. She had a supracondylar fracture. She went elsewhere, and brush nail was done. In this X-ray, also you can see there is absorbed fracture end. and she was walking right one month after the surgery full weight bearing after 6 months she had the broken rush nail then she got operated elsewhere again with orif and bone grafting and again when she came to me she had abnormal mobility at the fracture site she had a painful gait and flexion was limited to just 20 degrees I planned for a total knee replacement with a with implant involved, of course. This was the intra intraoperative photograph. As my finger is pointed, there was this non-union. Okay, and there were three screws broken. I had to use a uh, a hollow mill to remove the screws. I removed the plate, and this was the joint like. So after the arthrotomy, there was no clear demarcation of the condyles. i opted for a revision knee uh, a revision knee system of smith and nephew and this was the post operative x ray i was very happy with uh, in this case because initially i had to remove all the uh, the callus which was there i had to correct the angulation which was there in coronal plane i used a, a stem extension of 220 mm on the femoral side i used a stem of 160 mm on the on the, on the tibial side I used the 18 mm constraint poly insert in this case. The patient is comfortable right now. She is walking comfortably without support. Unfortunately, I I don't have the recent video because this was done uh, again in uh, in January, as you can see in this X-ray. She is very happy, and me too. So take home message: single stage total knee arthroplasty in periarticular deformity is a successful and rewarding surgery. Patient can be mobilized easily. and but the thing is preoperative planning and choosing of appropriate implant is must thank you so much wonderful i think that was a quick a good presentation um so we will have uh, some questions on that uh, yeah. did you notice there was extension deformity of the second case yeah you have to keep that in mind when you do because the worst thing any tkr have is hyper extension so yeah. this kind of knees if are not being careful hmm. they can go into hyper extension and early loosening how did you correct that one so my cut was very minimal in the second yeah. case and i used the thick poly and uh, my soft tissue lesions was very minimum right okay and what to made you to use a constrained knee rather than a hinge knee why did you use a hinge knee So because it was possible by using a constrained poly, if 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 my ligaments, if my collaterals were not sufficient enough, if they were, uh, if I if uh, by chance uh, I would be able to um, uh, go for poly about twenty four or twenty five, then maybe I'll be using a hinge knee because my collaterals are not sufficient enough. So in this case, it was appropriate. I I so got the collateral was stable. Yeah, collateral okay. was stable. That's right. Sanjay, my good yes. friend. Anything Hello, good sir. Good evening. Good Hi. evening to you. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, it was an excellent presentation from Akhil. Uh, just in the third case, as I, I have seen that a uh, lot of implantation was done before the surgery. Hmm. Uh, as you can see, you have removed screws. You have removed yeah. uh, the plate. Was there any concern for any infection? And how yes. did you do the workup? Because in in these type of cases, yes. workup for infection is very important. Yes, because otherwise you may fail in the post-operative yeah. period. The infection can again reappear. So, how did you uh, manage to do the proper yeah, yeah. What, work? What was what was uh, what investigations did you do to rule out infection? That's a very good point. Well taken. Yes, and for the audience, it's very very important. Whenever you do, mm. especially when you re replacing a hip or a knee for yeah. post fracture surgery, yeah. because the chances of infection very high for fracture surgery. Yeah. So you have to be, another yes. important so aspect is to send biopsies also. 
Yeah. yeah. So the intraoperative biopsy is very important. So what did he do? Sir, so, uh, on exam, there was no local rise of temperature. Yeah. Uh, apart from my blood investigations, I got uh, CBC, ESR, CRP done. So ESR, CRP yes, was yes, in normal, normal limit. Yeah, yeah, they were normal. CBC count was, WC count was absolutely normal. And uh, I didn't send for biopsy and I didn't uh, got Culture, any other investigation done. You should done. send. You should send. Yeah. All revisions, see, routinely, that's all. Yeah. We, what we do, what I do in my theater, if it is not a primary knee, or suspicious primary, any implant or revision, hmm. there will be four bottles always ready. So uh, four samples will be taken for aerobic, anaerobic, hmm. TB and atypical. Fungus and TB. Hmm. That's a routine thing. Mm-hmm. And those mm-hmm. specimens should be sent before you start off mm-hmm. your rest of the operation because they will be left in OT. Most of the people forget it. They get tried mm-hmm. up. You don't grow anything. Mm-hmm. So they should go to the reception and to the micro lab within half an hour. Mm-hmm. Sir, I also, uh, sir, I also planned for interleukin 6 uh, investigation, but I couldn't uh, have it done uh, with myself. Yes, sir. Interleukin okay. 6, yeah. Okay. That was not done actually. Come on, the last comment from you. Yeah. Well, I think he uh, very good uh, cases and very well done. Uh, you showed uh, robotics. Did you use navigation in this or you? Did no, not? sir. No, sir. It was done non-robotic, non-navigation. Actually, uh, in 2018, I first uh, you met with uh, robo. I will say I met with a robo. It was uh, Smith and nephew uh, Navio. Now it has been uh, you know uh, now it is Pori now. So uh, I am buying Cubis. That is a uh, a uh, city based robo this cori and navio they are all image based robo and uh, uh, this uh, cubis which is a city based robo it's more accurate and uh, in my experience i say if i am doing if i have to do my dad's pkr i'll do it with the help of a robo because yeah. i know what i am doing why i am doing that yeah so that's what i was going to ask you now that now that you you know uh, with do you think that these cases would have been better off with navigation or I mean, you've done quite well. So with navigation, do you have any uh, further advantage? Uh, definitely, sir. Cases? Definitely. Definitely. Because uh, you have a precision, you have accuracy. Especially the extension, the extension yeah. deformity. Yeah. Yes, could, That's what Dr. Because navigation only does two things. Yes. It does tibial fibrotal cut. Doesn't yeah. do any rotational correction. Yeah. So yes, yes, that's yes, the biggest yes, problem. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I think running thank you, uh, yeah. short of time. Next one, I will. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Subhash Changi to present his case. Jyoti, yes, sir. can you yes, put his uh, share the screen as uh, by data? Yes, sir. One second. Then we will invite him. Oh, sorry, sir. Not this section. Yeah, yeah. So you next time you keep it ready. Yes, sir. I kept it ready actually. Go on. Yeah. Okay, good. Make it full screen, please. Yeah, I'm trying, but I'm not getting here full screen. No, no, no problem. We can read. We can see. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Welcome, Dr. Shubhash Jangit. He has done MBS, MS, TNB, MRCS, Basco, UK, MCH. He is Director and Head of uh, Joint Reconstruction and Orthopedics Fortis Memorial Research in- Institute at Gurga. His uh, special interest is uh, computer navigated and robotic reconstructive orthopedic uh, surgeries. He is uh, uh, a winner of the Golden Hands Award 2021-40s India. Uh, he was been the faculty member in Newmore Orthopedic uh, Conference worldwide. He has a book chapter in the management of limb length discrepancy during total hip orthoplasty. He has a numerous uh, paper publication. Uh, he has a membership of uh, Royal College of Physicians and Surgeon Glasgow. Uh, uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, Jyoti, yes, for the introduction. Well, I can yeah. see most of I have UK experience. It's nice to <laughs> meet people because how we think in UK. I mean, it's a, yeah. because they, they, safety comes first. They don't mm. take anything, no adventures. They are gone. Yeah. You Thank see. you, sir. Thanks a lot for the opportunity and the uh, beautiful faculty here. Uh, just a sec. Let me start the play. Yeah. So my case will be more or less uh, uh, in continuous with the Akhil's uh, last case. So I would like to start with the case straight away. So that's a 75-year-old female with the pain in both the knees. And she has uh, difficulty in performing the active, it's a windside deformity. 
on regular analgesic she can't uh, do anything without the use of any analgesic here and she is diabetic and hypertensive both are well controlled the challenge that she has been operated for both the knee, both the distal femoral fractures in 2011 we don't have any records available as in india people don't keep the records and uh, straight again the access that's a pre op access so you can see there is a valgus deformity there is a plate inside the distal uh, femur and a significant valgus deformity and uh, as we this is like uh, he removed the whole plate so things came in my mind let's see how the patient is walking in the pre op so that's the valgus and hyperextension deformity she is using a stick to walk And the other knee is in virus. She is due for the other side knee replacement next month, and she is walking with the valgus and hyperextension. So that's a classical. Most of the patients who have a significant laxity of the knee joint, they will walk with the hyperextension along with the valgus. So plenty of people uh, uh, seen her, and they advise her to go for a stage surgery because they want to remove the plate first and then do the knee replacement surgery. Because most of the people they don't have the navigation or robot to do a single stage surgery and the uh, patient came to me because of some these reasons because i use navigation for all my surgeries the advantage of doing a single stage surgery is that the patient has only one anesthesia one surgery they don't have to wait for the 6 to 8 weeks period between the pla- uh, plate removal and the knee replacement surgery and uh, even after replacing removing the plate and doing any replacement you have to use a stem extension on the femoral side to control the or to prevent any kind of periprosthetic fracture so i planned for the single stage surgery with the removal of only the distal part of the screw the reason being that side plate will act as a stem extension for the distal femur and i need not to uh, cover the whole uh, uh, screw holes to cover the Uh, to prevent the fracture, and if required, I would use a midas X to cut the plate. I have computer navigation. People who don't have the computer navigation, they can also use an external alignment device and the CM intraop to align their knees if required. The distal femoral malunion is very common in these patients because if the fracture would have been in a proper position, the arthritis would not have been that severe. So you need to be very very careful when you're checking for the rotation of the. Femoral component in these patients. Obviously, the implant inventory has to be from primary to constrained. We usually in India, as like you said, without ready, that we usually are able to manage them with the primary implants only, and keep all poly sizes available, like the largest possible size, up to twenty one or twenty three in different uh, implant uh, companies. You have, you should have the, all of them available on table. So just to give you a uh, brief, how the examination looked on anesthesia. It's a severe laxity. You can see anterior posterior. So the CR option is out. You had to use the PS knee first thing. You need to see there is a hyperextension. It's very minimal, but yes, there is a hyperextension. With this kind of severe laxity, I'm very very careful to cut very very less bone. There's a valgus deformity, but you see this valgus is reasonably correctable. So I'm not expecting a very great amount of lateral ridge in this patient. The only Thing is that I have to cut minimum so that I can use the as minimum size of poly as available. And the second challenge was that whether we will be able to remove those screws or not. Right. So first thing is that we went inside, and as uh, rightly pointed out, ready that we uh, and Dr. Karbanda that we always take the sample, fluid sample when we open the joint. And I send it for the culture, which will come after forty-eight hours or so. But I send it for the Acute, uh, like immediate report to me regarding how many PM and per high power field. If they are less than ten, it's not affected. If they are more than ten, we have to abandon the surgery. So it was less than five in this particular patient. So we removed all these three distal screws. You can see the damage on the medial as well as the lateral condyle. The lateral condyle is completely depressed, caved in, and the the plate is actually projecting beyond the femoral component, femoral condyle. So we cut the tibia. That's the minimal cut. It was approximately five millimeter from the lateral tibial plateau. And this is after the cut. I use navigation to cut the distal femur. And I tell you, even the distal femur cut was less. We usually cut nine millimeter, but this was just seven millimeter from the medial condyle and just two millimeter, very minimal cut from the lateral condyle because I didn't want the 
play this is still in the play to go beyond the my implant because that's going to impact impact on the uh, our poly as well the other important thing is that i just told you they are usually mal united mal rotated as you can see the chamfer cut there's hardly any chamfer cut in this patient in the lateral side and there is a defect as well on the femoral distal lateral femoral condyle so i used to screws to augment that because usually don't use the augments for my primary knees so i use these screws to build up the cement metal there and it's a ps knee you can see there so this is after the implantation you can see the plate is still far away from the implant you can see the cement augment there which is holding along with the screws and the plate is quite far away from the implant it's not going to uh, there's no metal on metal reaction there I'll show you from the distal part as well. So there is a significant two millimeter gap between the plate and the implant. And despite using uh, doing the minimum cuts, I had to go for a fifteen mm poly. So that's why I want to say that these hyperextension valgus knees are really very very lax, and you need to be very very careful and keep all poly sizes on table. You can see very well that the plate and implant. Have a significant gap between them, so it's not going to impact on the poly or on the metal. Right, and that's after implantation. The deformity is corrected. There's no hyperextension, good flexion, and the stability also will check. So in full extension, you can see. So I uh, release the tourniquet when after cementation. So there's a good stability in full extension. As you flex, good stability. the cam post mechanism of the post should not be hitting any of the uh, metal uh, border from inside that's the key and this also required lateral release for the patella because of the scarring of the lateral lateral structures so that's a post up actually yeah, so we use the uh, stem on yes yeah, sir so that many second gone gone yeah yeah that's the that's the last slide that's a post up axis so you the plate is act actually acting as a support for the distal femur that's the immediate post of walking and that's at 6 months that's a wonderful very, wonderful very, case very well shown subhash uh, why did you use you, the extension in the tibia so because of the poor bone she 75 year old so my threshold to use a stem in the tibia is very very less very less and, and have, the moment i see Mm. If if I say if we show that to European, they would straight away use a hinge. Yeah, but I would be in a, in a, in that age group probably. So, Bash, I wouldn't be too concerned using a um, constrained insert like T C three because most of the time what happens is uh, standard tibia you can use a constrained uh, insert instead of T yeah. S you can use a constrained if you are doubtful. But I think uh, especially one deformity which. Uh, um i'm very concerned is hyperextension hyperextension most of the people because they go up and down stairs uh, these people they they will very uncomfortable that uh, um, uh, hyperextension deformity is one thing we should avoid we should avoid but, but if so there the is ps plus poly was there with me and i could have used it because i have played no, no. support on the femoral side but dr routinely what i say to the company people about one of one um, what is that size of each uh, insert i keep each, with me each. um tc3 insert so that uh, or uh, even uh, um smith and a few genesis they also they do so standard tibia standard femur yeah. you can change the insert if you feel yeah. uncomfortable yeah. but dr reddy um, yeah. even if if you are concerned about hyper extension then the only hmm. implant which will work is a hinged not hinged. absolutely absolutely that's right that's what i said yeah. you if, if, if we if we show to anybody probably initially i thought my Uh, this thing is probably I would use a hinge, uh, but, but so this, uh, this patient is not having that seen, severe hyperextension deformity. Yeah, yeah it's not. What what I have. Seen, yeah, we have to differentiate two things: hyperextension due to bony deformity, you can correct it, no need for hinge. Hyperextension because of the soft tissues, soft tissue. then you have to use a hinge. I think that's what. Uh, if if yes, you have bony deformity because too much of erosion, too much of special femoral uh, erosion, you do get hyperextension. Because Indian knees are very lax compared to European knees. Okay, Subhash, yeah, Sanjeev, you wanted to add something. Huh? Yes, Sanjeev, Sanjeev, please go ahead. Yeah, one question. Yes, Sanjeev. Subhash. Hi, Subhash. Yes, Sanjeev. 
Hi, long, how are you? It's a long time we yeah. have met again. Okay. <laughs> Two years, yeah. yeah. It was a great thing, great, great case. The only thing I want to ask is that, uh, did you have any tightness in the lateral structures because it was a valgus knee? Yeah. And because of that plate, was there any difficulty that you faced? So, uh, frankly, especially to do the release on the lateral side. So that's what I'm saying. I showed you the pre-op under anesthesia <laughs> video. Yeah. It was reasonably correctable. So, I just released the ITV and the postulatal capsule. That's it. Okay. Very good. Okay. I, so, I, I quite you liked your idea of Subhash leaving the plate. The plate People, out. they want to show off, spend <laughs> most of the time and I, their energy in removing the plate. And by the time they want to do the knee, they are exhausted. There I go. There's no point in uh, showing off by training. They were done whatever minimal required. I think yeah, that's a well good thank message. You, thank you. Yeah, but Dr. Reddy and Subhash, uh, now suppose somebody is not used to a navigation uh, and Dr. Uh, Reddy does not want to remove a plate. And then you said then you use an extra medullary, you know, uh, 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 technique. There's a, there's a. That's not a very good technique. You know, it's not. Uh, it, it won't give you a very good valgus. No. Uh, I mean, normal valgus. Think... So, is there any anything else you can suggest? Like so what? I, guess, sir, I can, I can, I can tell you, sir. One thing which you can do with the external device is like you cut the tibia, you put your minimum ah. size uh, uh, plate, tibial base plate on that, fix it with the uh, two pegs on the tibia. Use the alignment rod, right, sir? And use the alignment rod along with the axis. Use a CM that you are perfectly fine. And then align your distal femur cut with the tibia. With the tibia, yeah. You yeah. make it parallel. Yeah. So you t- you're taking three checks, CM, extramedullary jig, as well as the tibial cut. Uh-huh. You get 90% accurate, sir. You want to? Yes, sir. Uh, Karbanda, I wanted to ask Karbanda. You got, you got, see, this is one indication where navigation, I, I don't use navigation most of the time. I use conventional. I'm quite happy, mm. though we have these things because well, I feel too cumbersome. But this is one case where if you want to do, don't want to take the metal out, it's a good case. Like yeah. in extracular deformity. Right. Do you have any other technique to do the... No, uh, no, I think, you know, here, uh, as Subhash said, I think uh, that one technique is very good technique where you, you know, you have three checks, uh, you know, with this, but there's one more thing, which is a uh, sort of a stage one type of navigation, you know, the basic navigation, and that is just to take the uh, femur cut, and that is with eye assist that you get with the Zimmer. Yes. So yeah. that is quite okay. Even people who are not used to navigation uh, can also use that. It's a very simple thing, and all it does is take your tibia cut and femur cut, distal, distal Absolutely. tibia and distal femur. Yes, so distal tibia, of course, we don't need. I mean, uh, tibia cut, we don't need. But distal femur cut, you can use that technique and rest, you know, you go ahead with your own, uh, you know, normal thing. So that's not a very, it's a basic navigation. It's nothing. Basic navigation. The, uh, so that can be. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, you very much. For if you're using it, okay, one point. point. Make mistake, uh, yeah. Dr. Subhash, actually, you use yeah. two screws basically on the lateral condyle of the femur. So that was uh, where the navigation was helpful pr- probably to you because otherwise it would have been difficult to ascertain where exactly you want to leave it proud, the screws. Yes. Because otherwise yes. you couldn't have corrected that valgus. Corrected the yeah. Absolutely, yes. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. I think our next thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. speaker, my good friend uh, Pradeep Bonsley is going to present uh, fused hips. Uh, Jyoti, you're ready with the slide? Very good. Excellent. Yes, it's sir. It's getting better. Yes, sir. Uh, welcome, Dr. Pradeep Bosley. Uh, he has, has done MS Ortho from Bombay, D Ortho, DNB Ortho, FASIF uh, from Germany, FASIF from Swiss, trained in navigation and robotic surgery. He's a director of arthritis and joint replacement surgery uh, at Navnavi, Navanati Max Super Specialty Hospital at Mumbai. He was ex HOD Orthopedics uh, KEM Hospital and said GSMC. Mumbai and Anava Joint Replacement Fellow at uh, New York, USA, 1997. In, 30, in, in his 34 years of experience, he has done 16,000 replacement surgeries, uh, took joint uh, replacement uh, training from major institutes across the world at USA, Australia, Germany, Swiss, and Singapore. He is a guest faculty at International Arthroplasty Conferences. Uh, over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, 
thank you very much. It's a golden opportunity. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, I'm able to. Okay. okay. So uh, my topic is uh, THR for conversion of fused hips. Uh, you know, these are the common indication. Ankylosing spondylitis is very common in India, and everybody must be getting some cases of fused hip with ankylosing spondylitis. Young males, and these are the difficulties. I'll explain all this in detail. Uh, so one important uh, feature in fused hip, even after long period of fusion. Once mobility is achieved by THR, muscle function improves progressively over three to six months. Pre-op planning is very important for various issues, especially the pelvic obliquity. Uh, anesthesia in a fused spine, uh, two things are available. Uh, we have tried uh, epidural and spinal because the window of ligamentum phlegm is never fused, even in fully ankylosed spine. And the conventional technique is transnasal endoscopic intubation, which is atraumatic and safe. So that solves the problem of anesthesia. Uh, approach, uh, this is one very important approach because a lot of ankylosing spondylitis patient has got external rotation deformity and very difficult to uh, do osteotomy. So Bosley's dual hip surgical approach practiced for last 29 years with anterior exposure with external rotation, it's very easy to expose the neck and resect the neck. Once you resect the neck, you get mobility and you can go safely posteriorly and uh, release all the soft tissue and complete the THR. So, advantages are single incision, front, back, hip exposure, abductor preserving, better soft tissue balancing, less instability, prevent impingement, better implant placement and no dislocation in this series. So this is the approach, single incision. You can see the anterior exposure. The spike is put under the gluteus medius and exposing the neck and one spike in, uh, medially. And once you excise, you get a good mobility and you gradually do THR safely. So this is how the exposure, anterior exposure, very safe. And you will see the posterior exposure, vertical leg position is an excellent guide for stem version. It is better than anterior. So identification of true acetabulum is very important. And there's always fat pad in pulvinar in 100% of the cases, which is a very good landmark. The version is very important. So irrespective of the pelvic position, uh, to see the anatomical position that Tal is very important. So inferior part should be parallel to tal. So inclination, if it is just inside, inclination is about 45 degree. And second is Mac Columns line. If you take a line from, it's an imaginary line from uh, sciatic notch to anterior superior ilex spine. So rimming should be done perpendicular to it. That gives the native antiversion. Very important is uh, when there's external rotation deformity, the posterior capsule the posterior part, there is no capsule for closure. So you have to create the quadratus flap and some scaffold for closure is very important. Single stage bilateral THA has many advantages for mobilization and ambulation and the cost. So last 31 years, I've done 251 hips, uh, bilateral 58, Bosley's approach 118. There were some complications. So few examples, tackle deformity, Wind swipe, also called as wind swipe deformity, one side adduction, other side abduction. And you can see this is a spine is fused, and both the hips are fused in this position. And it's like a log of roll and is rolling like this. You can imagine an ambulation. So, very challenging case, and it can be done. It takes some time, but you have to be very great. And once you do neck osteotomy, you get mobility and you can complete your THR safely. Rarely you get bilateral abduction deformity. Young patients, you can see a lot of young people have bilateral fused uh, hips and they're hardly able to ambulate. And they can uh, start walking and even sometimes they can sit on the floor. That's the beauty of uh, using large head. Sometimes rheumatoid also you can get a bilateral fusion. 
जाओ पीछे और जाके डोर के बाजू में देखा फिक्स फ्लेक्शन डिफॉर्मिटी एंड एट पूरा पला पोस्ट ऑफ फोर्टीन इयर्स पोस्ट ऑफ फोर्टीन इयर्स दे कैन हैव गुड मोबिलिटी पेल्विक ऑब्लिकेट इज अ बिग इशू दिस इज अज हिप विथ कॉक्स स्पाइन स्पाइन करेक्टेड एंड देर इज अ यू कैन सी देर इज अ पेल्विक टेल्ट सो फ्यूज साइड इज डाउन एट डिग्री ऑफ पेल्विक टेल्ट एंड एनाटोमिकली यू करेक्ट एट फोर्टी एट डिग्री टू क्रिएट फंक्शनल स्टैंडिंग इंक्लेनेशन ऑफ फोर्टी डिग्री सो दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इंक्लाइन पार्ट इज फोर्टी एट डिग्री एनाटोमिकल सो दैट फंक्शनल इज फोर्टी सो दिस प्री ऑपरेटिव कैलकुलेशन इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट समटाइम्स दर इज अ बायोलेट्रल फ्लेक्शन डिफॉर्मिटी एंड यू कैन करेक्ट इट सूडो काइफोसिस यू कैन सी ही इज वॉकिंग लाइक दिस स्पाइन इज एंड आफ्टर नाइन इयर्स completely straight sometimes there is a knee ankylosis also and here he required a hinge knee hips are usually done first and this is one case of 31 year old follow up with bilateral revision and he is walking comfortably both the etio osteodomies are solidly united and hips are stable so in conclusion Gluteus muscle function improves once mobility is achieved. New Boesler approach is very useful when there is a excellent rotation deformity. Cementless THA has got a lot excellent osteointegration. Single stage bilateral THA has many advantages, and results of spontaneous ankylosis are better than arthrodesis. Highly demanding and highly rewarding. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful, Pradeep. Whenever I. Listen to your lecture; it's like a feast of fused hips. Thank you. And I think that's the more most important uh, point you said was uh, the polymer fat. It's always yeah. there. Yeah. I think that's the key point. And uh, um, as you rightly said, do not hesitate to use C arm yeah. position for hip for uh, use of C arm. So don't don't be reluctant. Do you don't want to show off? Yeah. If you're not yeah. uh, sure, I think that's the. Uh, and I just yeah, wanted, to, wanted, wanted to know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wanted to know the um, what is the role? I mean, do you feel that the robotics will solve some of the problems in uh, in um, um, uh, these fused hips? Um, now, robotics uh, are coming uh, the way it is okay for conventional THR. but yeah. lot of parameters robotic is you give good feedback and it will yeah. uh, you have to understand you have to see the screen you have to do good pre operative planning so pelvic inclination is the most important thing and that data is not available with most of the uh, robotic it's coming up so there are some lacunes but uh, before using that you should know the basic how to operate in a fused hip so you should have the basic knowledge then it is uh, complementary to use the robot yeah sanjeev you wanted to say something uh i just uh, uh, that was an excellent lecture i always appreciate dr bhosle always has something new to us and uh, the only thing is that uh, we do in situ cuts basically sometimes when it's a fused hip when we don't know actually we definitely use the c arm as uh, illustrated by you and uh, we do in situ cuts in the neck and then we start reaming yeah and once we see the pulvinar fat which is mostly there and i think uh, we should uh, be well versed with the anatomy that is very important that is from uh, more, because it is very you need experience in this type of cases and the double approach i have no experience on that but i do certain some amount of fused hips where i use the normal anterolateral that's the normal approach which i go and here my incision will be slightly longer and here i want to orient myself first because the anatomy here is very important and i do in situ cuts in between cuts in the neck so that then i try to identify uh, most uh, that we see the tear drop and we see the uh, the ligament and we try to reach the fat most of the cases we get the fat and there is some amount of uh, uh, mobility once you reach the once you start reaming you will definitely get to the floor and you get some amount of fat and i think we can also use the cr in these type of cases 
No, no, yeah. you should not be reluctant. Uh, you should be. Your shoulder one? should be very low using a C arm. Yeah, so, Pradeep. Uh, Pradeep. Um, yeah. You know, most of us have done, including me, uh, you know, fused hips uh, purely by posterior approach, and we have all been successful and not have problems. What special advantage do you get by using dual approach? Okay, very good question. Now, twenty uh, to forty percent of the fused hip they have external rotation deformity. and whenever there is external rotation deformity using posterior approach the trochanter is very close sciatic nerve is very close and if you see the uh, direction of the osteotomy it can go in a acetabular direction so it's very difficult to put your osteotome uh, in a right way so that uh, you will cut only the neck because the trochanter is almost approaching the acetabulum at the same time with the same incision uh, the anterior exposure is so easy everything is directly in front of you put your finger under the gluteus and put a spike expose the neck cut the neck and put spike mm -hmm. inferiorly superiorly and you get entire neck in front of you so safely you can cut the neck once you cut the neck you get a mobility you do internal rotation and safely release all the contracted issue that is absolutely okay. important because unless you do a good soft tissue balance you cannot uh, mobilize them safely you know dislocation rate in fact i must share that out of uh, 118 patients where i use this approach there is not a single dislocation otherwise i've got a five dislocation so soft tissue balance and even component check impact you can uh, see the impact in everything both anteriorly and posteriorly very safely it's important well dislocation did not happen in your cases because you are expert in putting uh, orienting that, your no, that is that back. is one but soft tissue balance is very important yeah so okay. if there is a good soft tissue balance it really helps yeah. Yeah. but pradeep don't you think uh, especially with uh, because i do anterior lateral approach lunar approach yeah with the flexion deformity people have advantage if you go entirely anteriorly you are perfect so anterior approach that is one more use of anterior approach i can release all the tight structures anteriorly as you said correctly but when there is a posterior uh, tightness it is very difficult to do by anterior lateral approach yeah. you need a proper complete release yeah yeah and the other thing i wanted to um, ask you to convey for the audience when you cut the neck in situ i mean fused hips most of the time you do Uh, we any any tip any um, I means any tip cutting the neck okay now i'll say that almost everybody will get some cases of fuse because ankylosing spondylitis young males are very common in india and yeah. everybody will see these cases so it's not difficult basic first principle is uh, cut the neck safely once you cut the neck your job is over you just rotate and release all the soft tissue and identify the true acetabulum as correctly said by everybody uh, that fat pad is always there so see that you remove the head debulk very gradually uh, prevent damage to acetabular walls because that is very important the direction you rim little bit go and see very uh, step wise you know so that you preserve the wall and uh, use the gouge and reach up to the fat pad and you can easily debulk the head very safely you can take uh, help of cm also and you can even drill a hole with a guide wire and yeah. see the depth you know that these are very important things to get the uh, native acetabulum and go beyond the you bottom out the head very important so it's no. not difficult once oh. you spontaneous is very easy once you cut the neck you can rotate and you can uh, do thr safely So for a one more tip i just want to pass on the to the audience is sometimes if you have a single saw cut difficult yeah. especially in a fused hip tight saw structure difficult yeah. to displace the uh, the uh, femur so, so sandwich is better is i to cut a uh, definitive cut maybe 5 mm above cut so that there is some space for uh, displacement exactly otherwise But, it sometimes yeah. it can crack while rotating so yeah. there has to be some space so that's a very good point so about 5 mm sandwich cut definitely double osteotomy and most of the time i use saw and see that it is complete 
don't yeah. keep the incomplete bone and try to rotate otherwise yeah. it will splinter out absolutely for neck cut i want to say one thing one is that uh, you know uh, i always uh, use uh, reciprocating saw uh, so i start from the uh, inferior part and go towards the trochanteric side and uh, uh, you cut the neck as close to the acetabulum as possible don't worry about the obliquity don't uh, you know worry about anything as long as it's very close and once True. you know you get your uh, you know uh, limb rotated then you know you can cut it in the way that uh, dr pradeep said uh, you know uh, pu- putting the uh, you know i mean antiversion and all those things and sure. the calcar whatever you want to keep so that's uh, you know but i always use reciprocating saw what do you use pradeep you use i use the reciprocating yeah. i use the standard saw so i'm uh, used to it i'm happy with it one point i want to mention that pelvic position it is very important to understand the uh, rotation of the pelvis and uh, always uh, learn to use the natural anatomical parameters like uh, as i mentioned maculum's line or the tall is the best landmark so yeah. every case tall is present you must identify many time it is covered with bone so go little uh, and try to isolate the tall which is the best landmark for uh, version Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's. Right. I think the important point, what you mentioned is, you cut should be complete. Other you yes. splinter, and you end up in trouble. Sometimes the splinter can extend into the shaft. Yeah. And too much of force. So make sure, without damaging the structures, you make the neck complete cut. That's, that's important. A, that's so a that's why point. if you have a yes. double osteotomy, you can see other side. True. And if you saw, you're worried about saw. Take a nice osteotome mm-hmm. and gently break the opposite cortex. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. That sir, was a wonderful. Sir, wonderful sir, talk. sir, oh, sir I, I, I had one uh, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Doctor Hosley, sir. Yes, yes. <coughs> yes. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, that was a very nice uh, lecture. Uh, I never use your uh, BDHS technique, but uh, uh, now I feel like I should use it. I will try in my next cases. I have done seven eight cases of bilateral ankylosed hip, and uh, I also observed that uh, you have used lot of bilateral metal on metal. So, do you really miss them right now? Because I have seen no, lot have, of lot last year. Yeah, we are stopped when the time okay. was there because the one principle is the larger the head, better yes. is the mobility. So that was the principle, and when yeah. uh, metal on metal came, it was very popular. So we used it. But, uh, but uh, fortunately, uh, yeah. I have not seen any uh, ill effects so far. That's, That's what good. I want to submit, sir. Yes, and th- that is a uh, very I'll interesting thing. I wanted to uh, uh, ask you also. I what is your wrong? Yes, I yes. use all I, I use I, I use ASR depu hip, and uh, all we are doing fantastic. And they are the most satisfied hips I have done ever. They don't But complain. They are doing all. Yes, I know. I know, uh, sir. We know that. Yeah. The discussion yes. is not there in any of the hip society meetings. I just wanted to know the experience yes. of uh, Bosley sir because he has, he has shown a lot of like, such experiences and they, they are wonderful. Thank you very much. We'll move on to next talk by Dr. Sunil Dachipelli, my good friend by same place. Uh, Jyoti, if you are ready with this uh, slide. Yes, sir. Go on. Uh, welcome, Dr. Sunil Dachipelli. He has done MS Ortho, MRCS, uh, and MCH, FRCS. Uh, Trauma and Ortho. He is a consultant orthopedic surgeon at Ashoka Hospital, Somaji Gudda, Hyderabad. He is uh, specialization in shoulder, hip, and knee arthroscopies, joint replacement, and sports medicine. He perform both elective and trauma work, and uh, he teaches undergraduate students uh, from all over Andhra Pradesh for MRCS. He has numerous publication presentations uh, in his name uh, in the national and international platform. Uh, close factor of radius. Are ulna in adults treated by plating or uh, intramedullary nailing? Or do you, sir? Doctor Sunil, you are on mute. Please. Can you yes, please? Yes, Sunil. Can you? Yes, sir. I'm um, just going to my screen now. Yeah, share screen and then can. I'm clicking on the screen. Sure, sure. Did you get it? Yeah, share screen. Yeah, share screen. Yes. And there is a lot of about the way you are sharing screen. I'll just say, yeah, um, yeah, gone, gone. Good. 
You ready? You see you. Make a bigger screen. Uh, thank you. Trying to get that one. You can just put the F five. Uh, it will automatically yeah. go to top. F five. Function five. Both together. And that. Not coming. Go to the bottom. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you're on. Now, yeah. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see you all, and uh, I should thank uh, Ready Labs and Dr. Kechiredi sir uh, for this opportunity. Uh, without taking much of your time, so we're going to discuss something very new and uh, very interesting because it's giving a lot of good results. We have seen the numbers are increasing. That's the reason I chose this topic, the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. I was lucky enough to do my first one in 2011 in London. Uh, for a lady who was 76, I'll show you the pictures, and uh, it's you know the range of movements have increased. So I'll quickly go through. We all know the anatomy and the stabilizers. So that's the main difference, as we all know, the glenohumeral joint and the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. The main concept of this is we are using the deltoid. Now the rotator cuff is almost or near total tear, so you want to use the deltoid both as a flexor, abductor, and an extensor. and uh, that's where you distalize and medialize the center of rotation of the joint so thereby the chance of dislocation is less and the range of movements increase so this is more of an engineering as we all know the biomechanics so with the deltoid being stretched what you get is the deltoid acts in most most function like a rotator cuff and uh, there is a classification for this the rotator cuff tear arthropathy and um, as you can see we can uh, you know guess the pseudo paralysis as we all know it's not a neurological issue it's mainly to do with the cuff and uh, most of these patients end up with a neurologist though and we also can see there is a escape if the coraco acromial ligament is not intact because the cuff is gone there is no restriction at the top and uh, the head can escape that is why we need to be very careful when we do the total shoulder arthroplasty or a hemi arthroplasty because that's going to fail so please always check your cuff if in doubt go for a reverse the results are really good i'll show my uh, one of my cases actually you might say the cut seems to be okay but i prefer to do that because there was age related changes and also fat related changes now you also see lots of uh, you know proximal humerus fractures where in early days we used to somehow fix it end up with disasters implant uh, breakage then going into the glenoid range of movement decreased so what i have seen worldwide nowadays attending lots of conferences around people are preferring to go for the reverse shoulder and uh, and also what we should see is uh, you know which are the indications okay now we'll also can include the rheumatoid arthritis patients the failed arthroplasty patients most important my suggestion is selection of the patient please don't go for a young athlete who has uh, you know a failed shoulder and you do a reverse shoulder they try to put it through all through you know range of movements and the function and it's going to fail and you don't have anything else other than this even fusing the shoulder might be difficult once you take out the implants so choose your patient right low function demand patients or if you're doing for somebody please explain to them that it's only for range of movements and not for you know are doing a you know pressurized work and also we should have sufficient glenoid bone stock and the most important the pivot here is the deltoid so make sure the deltoid is working and there is a intact axillary nerve as we all know the contraindication the first and foremost for any joint replacement is active infection then later on you can say relative glenoid osteoporosis probably you can get away with some you know terry paradite sort of things acromion deficiency deltoid deficiency axillary nerve dysfunction and operative planning always always get your planning right as my colleagues have discussed earlier so true ap axillary lateral and scapular y view okay you want to see the glenoid where ct scan i would suggest for almost everyone the reason being you need to see the glenoid stock if you don't you don't know where you're putting the screws and you will end up with a disaster mri it's up to you sometimes uh, you know clinical acumen now if you check your calf 
if you feel that's really weak and the passive range of movement is full, you already know it's a cuff tear. And I leave it to you if you want to do an MRI. It's not going to add much. Surgical approaches, you have deltopectoral and also the lateral approach. Choice is yours. Um, my personal choice is deltopectoral. The reason being, I can see nicely. The reason being this, remember, this is a reverse shoulder because the cuff is not there. I can easily go into the glenoid, retract the glenoid as well. But if you're doing a total shoulder, you might struggle. So deltopectoral, and um, we can also do uh, biceps tenodesis at the same time or tenotomy. Make sure you protect the axillary nerve, your cephalic vein. The anterolateral approach, again, uh, choice for somebody because you are dead on on the glenoid. See, at the end of the day, people struggle with the glenoid. So my suggestion is if it's a bulky patient or lots of muscles or very heavy, go for the anterolateral approach because you're straight on the glenoid. But if it's reasonably you know, thin patient, go for a deltopectoral. And uh, the technique, humorous preparation, we have to remember the inclination and also the retroversion. If you are failing, go for more retroversion. That is fine because you'll end up with more anti more axial rotation. That's happily accepted by the patients. Okay, but don't go for neutral or antiversion. And the humeral head, you can save it for an autograph for later. And if required, we can do osteotomies. Like I said, the biceps tenotomy or uh, tenodesis. And uh, this is what you can look at. You have the jigs. And um, initially, if you're training, go for uh, you know well-known companies because the jigs are perfect. The first one I did was Depew. Uh, it was called a Delta Shoulder. It was perfect planning. And uh, glenoid preparation, as you can see, the labrum, we exercise everything, whatever is possible. Make sure you can see the full view of the glenoid because not only view, you should be able to put your... Uh, the glenosphere in the center. So you have to get into the center of the glenoid. So you need to select your approach wisely and the central guide wire is vital. So you can use a jig or if you are if you have done enough cases, you can do uh, you know, freehand. Okay. And uh, if you are erring, go on to the base plate as inferior as possible and also with an inferior tilt. We all know one of the main complications of the reverse shoulder is a scapular notching. So if at all you're going down, the chance of scapular notching is less. And uh, the superior screw is generally aimed at your coracoid base and the inferior screw is aimed at the scapular body. So it's almost like that. So that's where, about two more minutes. Yeah, sir. That's where you have the uh, glenoid stock. And uh, then later we do the tuberosity repair. And these are the implants. So I was very fortunate enough to operate on this lady in London in 2011. So I did both of uh, the shoulders and she's doing perfectly fine. Even now she keeps on uh, sent me, sending me messages. Now this is the recent case, as you can see, uh, I was talking about the X-ray. If you see on the left bottom, um, this was like, you know, a choice whether you want to go for a total shoulder or a reverse. Nowadays, we are fortunate enough to get uh, the platform system, uh, like you can see on the top picture. So go for the platform. If you're planned for the total shoulder and you want to change your mind, you might as well at the same time, you can change it. Okay. And uh, rehabilitation, sling, early rehab, probably passive and uh, pendulum exercises. Let the tissues heal. The common complications, we all know, scapular notching. And uh, we know the classification, the cerebral classification, as you can see here. And rarely dislocation, that's if the tissues are really lax. And uh, also you can see a bit of glenoid loosening. As we all know, infection is one of our uh, enemies. And rarely, very rarely, you can see acromial or scapular frame fractures. So this you need to keep in mind. And if you can't, just go for a CT scan. Neuropraxia of the axillary nerve, usually transient. So to complete this, the take-home message is please plan wisely and uh, select your implants. Go for the one you're you know, comfortable with. And the RSA, the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, has become very successful and an effective option for a complete proximal humor cases uh, where you have an adequate bone stock. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. That was a wonderful talk.
um we'll have questions meanwhile jyoti you can put uh, next speaker rajiv not rajiv dr arvind prasad the by data dr sunil can i ask you one thing yes sir how do you make sure i mean with the obviously 100% confidence that the rotator cuff is deficient so that you can proceed to do a reverse shoulder and second second thing to that is that that means in the past you know uh, the uh, hemi arthroplasty that we were doing for older people that was all wrong because they would surely have rotator cuff insufficiency and that is why they should have had reverse shoulder as now they are you know done true I agree with so you can sir can you just unshare your screen while you're talking uh we'll do that sir one second just give me a second share <coughs> So it says pause share. Yeah, pause share. Hmm. Yeah, stop share is there. One second. Yeah. Sir. Okay. Stop. Good. Good. Okay. Go on. Ask right, yeah. the question. Right. So Otherwise, ask uh, my question. friend Karbanda will get very oh. upset. See, this is no, 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 not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm actually asking for benefit of everybody. <laughs> I know. I know. There is one more question after this. After that, we'll have next talk. Sure. Thank you very much. I mean, see, always this dilemma. So that's why, if at all, like I said, if you have pseudo paralysis. You're hundred percent sure your cuff is gone. If the uh, no neurology is fine, okay. And uh, it, there are you know ish cases like you know you're not very sure the rotator cuff is there, but we don't know whether it's really good or not. You have fat infiltration. Is it good enough? You want to go for total shoulder or a reverse shoulder? For that's why I'd suggest we go for the platform systems nowadays. So the approach you choose depending. I my personal choice is depending on the patient uh, bulk. and uh, you know the recent uh, re reverse shoulder i've done was antro antro this one the uh, you know pectoralis uh, approach and um, the when i went in i could see the cuff was intact but not and as intact that i would be confident enough just to get away with the reverse shoulder so my you know the the planning was if at all i go for a reverse this gentleman was 72 so it's going to give him at least another 20 25 years that should give him you know his life isn't it and uh, he'll have good range of movements if i go for a total shoulder and probably after a year or two if he has a retear there is proximal migration then you know probably i won't be very happy so like you know answering your question always go for all the choices your armamentarium i would suggest platform systems and then you can change your mind in the theater is mri scan of any use yes sir like i said in my slides if it is a pseudo paralysis there is no point because it's it band or obvious and if it is 50 50 then probably mri to make a decision but still i would still go for whenever i do for a total shoulder i go for a platform system hmm. yeah uh, i think is it uh, important i shall we move on because we finish we are we're supposed to finish meeting by this time Okay, just one, one small question. Yeah, quick one. Yeah. Quick one. In the four-part fractures, especially uh, yes, where we can easily repair the yes, uh, tuberosities, is it not uh, uh, conducive to do a total shoulder replacement rather than going for or a hemi arthroplasty rather than going for a reverse shoulder? Agree, sir. Now, you know, there are lots of studies with regards to the trauma, and uh, worldwide people are you know edging more over to the reverse shoulder. The reason being. the chance of malunion non union and having cuff deficiencies or related retear of the cuff because it's all the elderly so osteoporotic fractures so if at all you have the reverse shoulder at least you're not depending on the cuff for the tuberosities even if it doesn't heal you have a stem and also the deltoid is functioning as a rotator cuff so it's going to give you function thank you very much sunil that was wonderful talk there is a question on the chat box you can answer directly and i would uh, invite the uh, next speaker uh, arvind prasad gupta jyoti you are ready with the slide yeah dr jyoti uh dr jyoti just a second sir i'll just put it down wait a second yeah, yeah. she might have fallen asleep bedtime no, 
Hello. Sir, is it visible now? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. go on. Welcome, Dr. Arvind Prasad Gupta. He has done MS Ortho, ALTS in India and MRCS Glasgow, UK. He is a consultant orthopedic and sport injury oh. surgeon at Paras HMRI Hospital, Patna. He, is, he has specialization in orthoplasty for both knee and hip. He has orthospagic uh, ACL, PCL, PLC, MLC, reconstruction of knee. He has uh, he is specialized in arthroscopic shoulder, bankers and rotator cuff slap repairs. He has numerous publication and presentation. One among this is role of tropical tranexamic acid in controlling post-operative bed loss in total knee arthroplasty. Over to you, sir. Yeah, Dr. Arvind Prasad. Um, uh, now is, you can share the screen. If you can finish seven, eight minutes, I think we'll have time for this. Thank you. Dr. Arvind, sir, you can put your hands uh, Yes. I just uh, attended a retraining of uh, MRCS uh, um, faculty because there was a gap about uh, six years. So that the trainers training program I attended recently. Uh, good evening, yeah, go So I'll be discussing uh, two cases of uh, virus knee and uh, cases of uh, ME replacement in combinated proximal humerus fracture. So four minutes each. Yeah. So uh, this 66-year uh, male, a military man, no any comorbidity, having bilateral knee pain with varus deformity. And this is the X-ray. In X-ray, we can appreciate the severe varus deformity along with the bone defect on the TBL side, medial TBL side, both on the right and the left. The right side is bigger one. And with conservative uh, uh, resection of the femur and the tibia, this much of the defect we can see. So all the uh, primary steps of the TKR has been taken care, removal of the osteophytes and release, all these are there. So I'll, I have escaped all these. And this much of defect we can see. So almost uh, more than 35% of the surface area of the medial tibial condyle is there. So uh, these are the options. But uh, with increasing bone dissection, we have seen that the subcondyle bone strength will be uh, decreased. With the translation of component with this much of the bigger effect will lead to the um, this uh, transmission of the weight bearing in a different way with a smaller size. Bone cement is not uh, very helpful. So we have left with the bone graft, metal wedge and augmented TVL component. So I use bone graft in this case, having advantage of its preservation of the subcondyle bone with uh, no cement fragmentation provide the uniform cement thickness and avoid the use of custom implants. But there is disadvantage also, like graft may be limited if defect is bigger. The fitting of graft is another difficulty. And at the same time, the incorporation of graft is very unpredictable. So this is the technique. You convert the concave defect into the a smooth one and use the resected bone from the tibia and femur and fix with K wire, then convert with the screws. So this was the uh, intro picture. The measurement of defect was done and the graft was fitted into the defect, check its fitness and fixation with one screw followed by two more screw. At this point, you have to be very careful that this screw is not going into the area of your tibial tray or if you are using TVL stem, it is not going into the canal. And this is after the TVL tray fixation. And since this was the severe virus deformity, so release on the posterior and uh, this uh, semi-membranous part was done. And this was the X-ray uh, uh, immediate after two weeks of the surgery. This was the another side, only cement was used because no much of the bigger uh, defect was there. And this is after the one and a half year. The graft is getting incorporated on the this uh, cancellous side, but uh, cortical side is just still uh, doubtful. Patient is doing fine walking. There is no problem. This is another patient. This is very uh, characteristic of the patient of knee osteoarthritis in our area. Patient come with this much of deformity with this walking pattern most of the time. And this was the X-ray of uh, the left knee. Uh, the stress fracture was diagnosed almost nine months earlier and she was walking with this. And this was on the right side, this much of the virus and again impending fracture on the right side. 
So of course, uh, considering the stress fracture, TVL stem is the choice, having this lot of advantage of this. But there is some disadvantage also because of a stress shielding along the length of the stem. And this decreases the bone density and associated side effect of that. Uh, th even though we used the TVL stem, that was the only one choice in this case. On the, uh, on the stress fracture side, we used plating also uh, because it was nine month old. I don't know whether it was right or wrong, but we do plating also considering patient cannot go for the second time surgery. And other side, only with the lung stem because of the impending uh, stress fracture was there and we use of the cement was there. This was at the time of suture removal, walking gait. He can walk independently without a stick. And this is uh, uh, in the follow-up period, you can see the this stress fracture is getting healed properly, both in AP and lateral view. And this is the recent one, almost after two, two and a half year after surgery, almost close to the three year. This is just yesterday uh, video picture patient sent to me. This is 52 year male uh, coming to the shoulder, comminuted uh, proximal humerus fracture. CT says it's head splitting with anatomical neck fracture with dislocation. And considering the age, I think Dr. S uh, Sunil will not be agree with uh, this reverse shoulder. So this is the total uh, treatment part, what we hemi or reverse. So, Usually we do most of the time, almost 99% of the cases, such type of fracture with hemi only. And the first sort is the best sort. And like any other surgery, this surgery is also having some principle. And if you follow that, your result will be very good. Even though this surgery in the Europe is a dead surgery nowadays, but in our hand, if all these principles get followed, this surgery do very well. Like restoration of the height, restoration of the retroversion, size of the head and the tuberosity repair. So height, we can take the help of the pectoralis major at this point, usually in between 5.5 to 6 centimeter for the retroversion, either bicipital groove or the external rotation of the forearm 30 degree and putting the implant in neutral position. Size should not be the bigger, it should be the equal. Otherwise, with bigger size, there will be over stuffing. And the tuberosity repair is very important. If you repair the tuberosity in a good way, this surgery is very rewarding. First, suture the tuberosity to the implant, both lesser and greater tuberosity. Then do the circlage around the neck. Then tuberosity to the tuberosity repair. And last, tuberosity to the shaft. And always check in the CM, look for the Gothic arch, whether it's maintained or not. Place of the, your greater tuberosity, what you have prepared, and there should be no over stuffing. And this should be kept in the abduction splint at least for three weeks so that your tuberosity will be in rest. And this is uh, in the follow up, this is at the three month follow up. That the three month, uh, you can see patient is uh, still unable to complete forward flexion and abduction, though internal rotation is fine. This is at the end of 10 month. And you can see at the 10 month doing full flexion, abduction and internal rotation. So hemi shoulder take almost 10 month to one year to having full function around the shoulder. That is another case, 62 year male various uh, uh, fracture of the proximal humerus along with comminuted with fracture dislocation on the other side. This is the full and one side fixation with the plate. That side was only various two, three part fracture was there. And on the other side, it was the hemi because of fracture dislocation. And this is in the follow up again in the follow up doing very good abduction both the sides. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. You so, kept uh, on time and uh, excellent cases. Yeah. Dr. Arvind, you are uh, Dr. Arvind, I want to tell, uh, say something about your bone grafts thing. Yeah. So when you have a large defect, you said in your slides that when you have a large defect, you may not have a good, you know, that one single piece of bone to fill up the whole uh, defect. It may be difficult to fix and there is a problem of resorption uh, as we could see there. So what I have, what I've been doing is uh, whenever there is a large defect of almost one centimeter, uh, you know, in depth, 
I use uh, impaction bone grafting and I use a mesh. The mesh, you know, the striker mesh, which is uh, used in the hips also. So I, it, it is very well, it gets, uh, you know, it sort of contains the defect. And then in that you, uh, you know, uh, just impact the bones, the chips, bone chips, which you have a lot. Uh, and that gives a very good um, uh, impaction. And there is no chance of any resorption. And it gives, and you can fill up any any cavity. So that technique may be better. Uh, I used to do the techniques that you showed first, and then I started doing this because we started getting patients also like that. So that is, uh, you know, one thing. Uh, which, uh, you are absolutely. So I think so. yeah, we have yeah. shifted to that mess part also. Yeah. yeah. So now many right. options are other bony options, cones, trabecular muscles are available, which are expensive. But I think I can quite agree with you. If a patient is not affordable, probably hmm. um, bone graft yeah. mesh generally the young patients would yeah. be. Yeah. But young patients, I think we have to want them instead of two operations, probably one good operation which will last longer, and then, then they will think about it. Yes, uh, I, I would slightly beg to differ here. Uh, in that osteoporotic bone, especially using the bone graft, would be slightly risky, as you can see that already there is some resorption. And one screw has broken also. And uh, the use of metallic wedge would have been slightly better with a stem. Because that uh, imparts immediate weight bearing can be achieved. And uh, there is no chance of resorption. And I think metal wedge would have been slightly better. And especially when the graft, when we are using, if it, there is a vertical defect almost, and using screws almost horizontal, probably there is a lot of shear which occurs. The, so the principle the metallic of wedge would have been slightly better. Yeah. So Screw you must not be more than 45 degrees to the horizontal. Absolutely. Then it will fail. Should yeah. be vertical or vertical. between 90 degrees Probably. to 45 degrees. Yeah. If it's more than that, I think probably chances. Horizontal will fail. Yeah. Uh, and so second you must thing have seen the use of stem in that case. So most of the stress is taken by the stem in that case. Usually in almost in our cases, whenever I use to put the graft, I always use tibial stem to prevent any stress on the graft. And these three screws in different direction will take care of your stresses. I have a lot of cases, but uh, this case I particularly put because of this resorption of the grass. So this is the 10% of our cases there is resorption. In 90%, that works very well. And also... Yeah, you're, you're right, I think, uh, Dr. Gupta, because stem will take stress for some time. If yep. it continues forever, it will break. The whole idea of putting a stem means the bone at the native place will grow back and it will support the tibial plate. If that's not happening, you can't rely on stem forever. It's going to break. Like in, uh, because it's a, because your stresses are not vertical, like in IM nail. Here, it's sharing forces are there. So it's going to break. So you should not rely on the stem for longer period. You Meanwhile, you are uh, this thing. But I think what happens is... Uh, um, with the resorption, then um, screw is broken means there is stress. And probably that will extend to the stem and uh, it will give up some time. Yeah. So I think uh, proximally, if you also want to send you right, right to point out, you should not, I think probably there's many options replacing with the metal wedge, cones, or uh, trabecular metal. So many options are there nowadays, but they are expensive. And second thing, Dr. Arvind, you said about your, uh, you know, stress fracture, the plate, whether you were not sure whether the plate should have been used or not. So I think, you know, here there's no problem of biology. Uh, here there's only problem of mechanics. And if you correct your varus, which you have obviously corrected, and you use a well-fitting, press-fitting stem distally, I think one should not use a plate because that can act as a distraction uh, for the fracture also. So as long as you know you have used a good, you have uh, uh, taken care of the deformity, you use a press fit stem, it's good to not to have a plate so that there is more compression and most of the fractures heal when you have done this. It was only nine months old, that's why... Uh, ah, I, I, know. I know, there's always an apprehension yes, and you don't want to go for a second time, yes. uh, you know, if you have some mobility, rotational immobility, uh, you know... Uh, fibrous tissue in between. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, wonderful cases, uh, Dr. Gupta. I would invite the next speaker, Rajiv Anand, to show his cases. Uh, Jyoti, you are ready with the slide? Yes, sir. 
welcome Dr. Rajiv Anand. He has done a DR or MS or Medical Chaki, College. Present the presentation slide is not there. Slide is not there. Slide is not there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, just show the slide first. Yeah, yeah. Because I've shared welcome. long back only. Yeah, disappear. Is it, is it visible now? No. You share the screen again. Okay. Yeah, now we can see. Go on. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I think Dr. Bose, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Make your screen bigger. And if you can uh, limit your uh, cases to eight minutes, that would be nice. Thank you, Dr. Rajivan. Mm -hmm. So good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, so after Boshle talk, uh, I think uh, this THR in anthologic spondylitis is the uh, repeat uh, topic. But I'll just present myself. Uh, I was uh, not told to be uh, present the case, but I just uh, uh, explaining it. So everyone knows that uh, anthologic spondylitis is a chronic inflammatory disease. Uh, which involves the sacroiliac joints, spine, hips, and uh, with very less commonly knee joints. And it is typically in young adults with a ratio of uh, male to female is <clears throat> three to one. And uh, especially hip involvement is bilateral in around 90% uh, of cases. So our aim of the total hip arthroplasty in these cases, are uh, pain relief, eradication of flexion contractures, an increased range of motion of the hip joint, improved mobility, and uh, correction of the portion. <clears throat> so, uh, pre-operative consideration in these cases are uh, uh, very, very important, and uh, it is essential in the technical consideration uh, for the both anesthetists and surgeons are important. So, thorough clinical examination, uh, physical examination should be carried out to evaluate and document the spinal involvement especially the pelvic obliquity, limb length discrepancies, and the status of the contralateral hip is very important, and the bilateral involvement and the sciatic nerve integrity is important. Uh, in these anthologic uh, spondylitis cases, uh, the patient age, activity level, and the expectation uh, after the surgery uh, are the important consideration uh, for the planning of uh, these type of cases. So <clears throat> coming to the radiology, uh, I would uh, suggest that the uh, x-rays of the entire spine should be examined to rule out any presence of pseudoarthrosis or Anderson's lesion of the spine. Uh, in case of pseudoarthrosis of uh, severe spinal involvement, uh, a spinal concentration should be sought out before doing a THR. There is a controversy, uh, debatable whether the spine should be done first or the hip should be done first. <clears throat> but uh, if the spinal involvement is uh, very, very uh, high, then osteotomy of the spine should be done first before doing the THA. So uh, CT scan is uh, important in those cases in which we have to see the pelvic obliquity because in these cases, the inclination and the antiversion, we have to uh, think beforehand so that uh, uh, we can correct the estabular cup properly. So by CT scan, we can see the bone stock, medial wall, and the femoral canal diameter uh, that can be assessed with the CT. Uh, those patients who are on drug uh, in the anthologic spondylitis, if they are on methotrexate, they should continue. But if they are on anti-TNF alpha, uh, the drug should be withdrawn four to six weeks prior to the surgery. Uh, templating is the uh, must before doing the surgery because by that we can assess the femoral size and the cup placement. Uh, but the rotational and obliquity, it is very difficult uh, to assess and may not be accurate. Uh, in these uh, cases, we can use uh, modular implant uh, for the uh, by depending on the proximal femoral morphology. So anesthesia is a big concern uh, that uh, Dr. Bosley has also said that uh, intranasal uh, intubation can be done, uh, but uh, doing a spinal is also difficult. So it has to be an anticipated uh, beforehand. And uh, we know that uh, <clears throat> in this type of surgery, there is a, a huge blood loss. So the blood should be arranged beforehand. Uh, coming to the technical consideration, uh, total hip arthroplasty in uh, anthologic patients 
uh, are really technically demanding, especially in the patients with the ankylosed hip. Uh, so the positioning of the patient, femoral neck cut, these are the important issues <coughs> which he has also mentioned earlier. Uh, original joint line identification is important. Vestibular component positioning and the adequate uh, soft tissue release. So position, uh, 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 what I do is in the lateral decubitus with sacral and pubic support. Uh, exposure, definitely if there is a preoperative external rotation deformity, uh, that uh, Dr. Bosley has also said that in most of the cases, the limb is in, fixed in external uh, uh, rotation. So visualizing the femoral neck uh, is very difficult in the posterior approach. So by the uh, uh, harding lateral approach also, we can uh, go through the, uh, approach the neck and visualize it properly. Uh, and tissue release, we have to do adductor tenotomy, iliopsoas muscle release, and the gluteus maximum release that uh, if there is a flexion deformity in most of the cases in AS, it is uh, flexion deformity. So gluteus maximum has to be released and sometimes anterior capsulotomy is needed in such cases. Uh, so because forcible correction of the flexible contracture with, uh, without adequate soft tissue release can re result in fracture of the stiff spine uh, uh, with uh, neurological consequences. So these, these things we have to keep in uh, mind and uh, flexor deformity puts sciatic nerve at risk because the sciatic nerve come very close to the uh, trochanter. So we have to take consideration of this also. So coming to the femoral uh, neck cut, as uh, he has also mentioned that one cut is sometimes not enough and we don't know whether the neck is completely cut or not. And uh, so then there's, there's, enough, uh, there's not enough space to work so uh, five to six millimeter, another cut uh, we can do so that we can get uh, enough space and we can do the surgery properly. So coming to the estabular pre uh, preparation, uh, direction of the estabular reaming is very, very important. And it, if the uh, hip is completely fused, then it is very difficult to analyze in which direction we are going. So help, uh, taking the help of CR is very, very important. So, uh, so can that we can make out that we are going in a <clears throat> right direction and whether we are approaching the joint line or not. So joint line identification also needs uh, CM, uh, CM to locate the complete joint line so that uh, we should not uh, go much beyond and uh, do some fracture. So in the presence of pelvic obliquity, accurate positioning of the estabular component is technically difficult. So in flexor deformity, anterior tilting of pelvis, there is a malposition of vestibular component often results and which produces anterior dislocation. So in this flexor deformity, we have to be careful uh, that uh, the positioning of the vestibular cup should be proper. The inclination, we have to declare, decrease the inclination according to the, to the obliquity. Uh, it is said that if his obliquity is more than 20%, and every 10% increase in the obliquity, we have to de uh, decrease the five degree of inclination and the uh, uh, antiversion accordingly. So uh, in these cases, decreasing the antiversion uh, version reduces the chances of anterior dislocation. So uh, in this fixed pelvic obliquity, uh, we, if uh, the pelvis is cephalad, then uh, we have to decrease the inclination and if the pelvis is uh, caudal, then we have to increase the inclination uh, for every uh, five degree or there's a eyeballing is also work that if there is a more obliquity, then uh, we have to uh, decrease the inclination in these cases. Apart from this in patient with the controlled hip flexed in abduction or adduction deformity, there may also be error in determining the true inclination of the estabular cup. And the pelvis is tilted cephalad if the contralateral limb is fixed in an abducted position. Here are some uh, few cases of ankylosing uh, spondylitis of the right hip, and uh, uh, total hip arthroplasty is done in these cases. Uh, is this particular this cases uh, I did uh, around 19 years back, 
the bilateral ankylosing spondylar ankylosed enclosed hip uh, tha was done cemented tha was done and in this 19 18 to 19 years uh, this has happened so there is aseptic loosening there is a uh, there is a, a vertical position of the cup it has happened and it needs a revision rajiv you got to one and a half minute to go yeah so the complication is uh, the anterior dislocation of the hip uh, there is a susceptibility to spinal fractures sciatic nerve palsy intraoperative fracture at the level of calcar femoral and these fractures can be well managed with a circumferential wiring aseptic loosening needs a uh, revision surgery and the hetero- heterotrophic ossification we can minimize by thorough washing of the surgical site and uh, giving endometrial chain for one or two months so that uh, will decrease the heterotrophic uh, ossification and uh, this case uh, i wanted to show you that uh, Uh, this has happened there is a fracture of the uh, medial wall while doing the stapler reaming so to rescue that uh, we have to put a bone graft taken from the uh, femoral head and then put the uh, stapler cup so the my take home message is uh, the proper assessment is of utmost importance for total hip arthroplasty in ankylosing spondylitis and adequate exposure and releases are very important and restoring biomechanics on the hip identifying the true estabulum uh, with the help of uh, uh, cm we should never hesitate and inclination and antiversion should be taken care to minimize chances of anterior dislocation and cemented versus uncemented is a surgeon choice but good long term survival shape has been reported with cemented tha thank you very much thank you very much uh, rajiv that was a very useful information if you i think next we will i think your questions will be included in the next panel discussion if you stay back now the panel discussion i would like to invite uh, dr uh, karbanda dr ak yadav dr ramesh babu dr sanjeev patnaik dr uh, gagan sachdeva Sir, if you give me a minute, I'll just introduce uh, everyone in one line, sir. Doctor sure. Ramesh Babu, see, he's a MS Ortho Senior Consultant Orthopedic Surgeon at Prashant Hospital in Chennai. Doctor Sanjeev Patnaik, sir, is a Senior or Consultant Orthopedic Orthopedician, Trauma Orthoplasty Orthoscopy Apollo Hospital at Bhubaneswar. Doctor Avdesh Kumar Yadav is a, a MS Orthopedician. He he is uh, he has awarded uh, in numerous platform like uh, pratibha samman 1996 1998 at akila bharatiya vidyarthi parishad up uh, dr etindar karyabanda he has done uh, mbbs dr to ms dnb mch the senior consultant orthopedic and joint replacement surgeon at indraprastha Hosp- apollo hospital new delhi Dr. Gagandeep is Sachdev is the Chief Executive Officer and Chief Consultant Orthopedic Surgeon and Joint Replacement Surgeon at SGHS Hospital, Mohali. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, Jyoti. And the rules of panel discussion is, uh, I will uh, put one, uh, um, what is that, question, and uh, we'll probably we'll go around the panelist, but it should be brief and crisp, short. no repetition there's no point in agreeing with somebody if you don't have anything to add kindly say so okay i think we'll start with the basics for the benefit of uh, audience um prophylactic antibiotics we'll start with the senior consultant dr karbanda i want to know what <coughs> antibiotics and the duration for orthoplasty well um, the accepted norm is uh, uh, kefiroxin what do you use Yeah, I, 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 I use kefiroxim. Yeah, uh, uh, half an hour in the theater, and uh, just for uh, three doses. Uh, three doses, very good, excellent. And how do you decide? Is a kefiroxim or augmentin? Is there any evidence based? Uh, you kefiroxim. decide, or somebody you take somebody's advice. Second generation, no. Uh, second generation kefiroxim, uh, cephalosporin has been the most common thing. unless they have uh, penicillin uh, uh, you know sensitivity which uh, kefiroxim has 10% cross sensitivity then i may use uh, something else but i don't use augmentin i may use in them uh, you know uh, vancomycin sure okay 
Sanjeev, anything to add? Or? Yeah, my, my prophylactic antibiotic is tecoplanin. Three doses yeah. of tecoplanin starting with one hour pre-op. Three why, doses why of tecoplanin. Uh, such a high level uh, antibiotic. Yeah. A, a, any particular reason? Yeah, in fact, probably it has been, I have followed that since I have started uh, doing arthroplasty. So probably it is my training. I just decided. So it's basically also liaising with the microbiologist is also very important in these cases. Mike, somebody is talking. Yes, go on. Go on, Sandeep. Yeah, most important is for the hospital, you have to liaise with your microbiologist. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's very important. Because convey the message, yes. So, and, uh, my, my prophylaxis is based on my culture in the, in the, in the uh, hospital and microbiologist. Yeah. Because yes. I want to use a prophylactic antibiotics, which is not used for routine treatment. Yeah. The antibiotic, which I use for a prophylaxis, I will not use for treatment of infections. And most of the people, I wouldn't expect them to use. And you should be sensitive to the bacteria in my hospital. Those yes. are the two principles based on my prophylaxis. Yes. And the duration, yeah, I think, I, excellent. Carbon yeah. dioxide. Yeah. Uh, not more than three doses. Ramesh, if you, I if, start uh, the, the previous yeah, just, uh, let me Let me just, Ramesh Babugaru, let me finish. Okay. Um, what, uh, if you put your video also so that you are there. Can you just no, put no, uh, video, video not able to all the panelists? All the, all the panelists, kindly switch on your video so that we can see. Um, Sorry, I'm saying. trying that to pass one, one hour. I'm not able to do that. So All I'll, right. I'll okay. you the take the advice from the help from the IT. Yeah, yeah, Please, sure. Can you start that one out? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll just do okay. it, sir. And uh, they see the whole idea is uh, um, duration because most of the see most of the surgeons I see they give antibiotics for five days, one week, two weeks without any logical reason. You should stop antibiotics after forty-eight hours. And also, because and if also, you're giving and longer. You're treating yourself, not the patient, and that's not doing any good. Yeah. And also, and also, Doctor Reddy, when it should be given? A lot of time, you know, in PGs, we, we were taught, uh, you know, uh, given the day before, the night before, or the. Uh, now the I think Harman, it's very clear. The prophylactic antibiotic is very clear. It should be given one hour prior to your incision, or one hour prior to your tunica inflation, and three doses, two to three doses post <coughs> Yeah. And the antibiotic should be, you should not use for treatment of infections and it should be based on your antimicrobial flora in your hospital. And, and you should consult with infectious team. Yeah. And there are still a lot of people using two antibiotics. Is there any role of that? Um, no, there is no role. Single okay. antibiotic, three to four doses. Okay. Scientific evidence do not support. And, the and can I, Ramesh Babu, can you, you wanted to say something? Yeah, yeah because see, most of us think only a medical legal aspect, but in fact, uh, uh, prophylactically, we give only for a psychological reason, only for us to be more comfortable. But none of us know how good it is. What, what duration you mean to say? Correct. Till, till the sutures are out? The timing, timing of your antibiotic, whether you give one hour or previous night or uh, some people start, as you say, one hour before uh, starting your incision. No, there is there people, so many uh, publications. Ramesh Babu, there are so many right. publications to suggest uh, uh, that you must give one hour and three doses. There is no controversy <laughs> about it. There is no psychological element. There is no medical legal element. If you follow these principles, you are medically legally covered. And there is no psychological element in this. I think we message should yeah, go very right. clear to all the audience. It should be our discussion. There is no confusion about prophylactic antibiotics. It's very clear and everybody should follow. And all orthoplasty right. surgeons should know about this prophylactic antibiotics. And we should not prolong more than three doses. Yeah. And you should not defend on it. One one last thing. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. Most of us see, most of us use uh, uh, catheters, urinary yeah. catheters, yeah. for probably one day or two yeah. days. Uh, do we? Yeah, I think, uh, Karmanda, you are muted. Yeah, I, the, the question is, I do not use, I do not use catheters because I do everything under spinal and femoral block. I do not use epidural. If you are using epidural, then you need catheter. Even I do bilateral, I use femoral catheters both sides, and it's quite safe. And you do no need for, because most of the time I tend to stand them up on the same day or following day. They are out in one or two days. So there is no, the requirement for catheter radius has come down significantly. 
we follow this one. So no epidural even for bilateral. Yeah. Any addition, Dr. Yadav, you want to add anything or no? If no additions, we'll move on to the next one. Dr. Yadav, you are on mute. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, I want to add, I change my prophylactic antibiotic after every six months. I uh, do it in rotation. I use cefuroxime for six but months. Be, yeah, I know. That yeah. should be evidence-based. Yes. You have to consult with uh, your microbiology team, yes. infection team. You can't change on your own because it should be evidence-based. If your culture is resistant for one particular antibiotic, then you, there's a reason to change. There's no point in changing just for the sake of changing. No. Yeah. There should be a good reason because we believe in uh, science and the scientific evidence. Mm -hmm. And there's in numerous studies. You must read uh, uh, so many, so many studies are there about prophylactic antibiotics, and there's no confusion. And the next one is the DVT prophylaxis. Sanjeev, what do you do for DVT prophylaxis? I usually start uh, almost like uh, uh, 24 hours post-op uh, yeah. because I use the catheter. Yeah. Uh, basically, the catheters uh, in draining epidural catheter, yeah. Yeah. Uh, epidural as well as the for the joint replacements, I use catheter inside the joint. I, yeah, inside the joint. Yeah. Okay. I okay. use catheter and I remove it in twenty four hours. I yeah. start the uh, that is almost uh, six hours after the removal of the epidural line. I start mm -hmm. with clexane. Yeah. I start low molecular weight. Yeah, low molecular weight heparin, and uh, I continue. Most of the patients, most yeah. of the patients, and if the patient is already uh, was on aspirin or some other sort of, uh, I usually continue with that. But uh, mostly, I use clexane to start with, and then once the patient uh, is uh, homebound, I usually give an oral anticoagulant. Right. Okay. Usually, okay. it may be eliquis, or it may be yeah. That is for almost almost uh, that is ten days, ten days post op. That is for a TKR. And I would continue for two weeks for a THR. Sure. Okay. Anybody else? Dr. Gagan is there? Can you hear me, Dr. Gagan? I can't see his picture. The, um, Dr. Reddy? Yeah. Who is this? Ramesh Babu. Dr. You want to say Dr. something? Ramesh yeah, Babu, yeah. Yeah, go on. I think your, your yeah. net is uh, probably not enough to take your video. Probably yes, move sir. the position, change the position so that you, you have good... Uh, Internet. Yeah. <coughs> or change it to mobile. Change it to mobile. We, we can't hear you properly, so we'll move on to Dr. Karbanda. In UK, we, we regularly give. Uh, okay, okay. Please, yeah. Like we can't, we can't hear you. Yeah, Karbanda, anything? Uh, see, other than uh, uh, chemical prophylaxis, I rely uh, on two uh, other things. One is good pain relief so that they can be mobilized early. Yeah, yeah. Important, mobilized very early. important. And second thing is, uh, like you said, blocks or whatever. Uh, and the second thing is, I use for everybody foot pumps. And as doctor during surgery, uh, uh, during the surgery as well as stop till the patient is uh, you know discharged. Yeah. Uh, and as Sanjeev said that. You know, uh, I use as uh, eco uh, aspirin for all the knees, but for hips, I you I give them uh, two weeks of uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin and six weeks for high. Uh, I mean, people who are very obese or high risk. have some high risk. And yeah. I just want to clarify, Harband, about aspirin. Yeah, it's I think there's a good evidence to say that aspirin do not have any role in DVT prophylaxis. That's right. It's been proven and there's so many publications. Yeah. That's but correct. aspirin has got other uh, good good benefits, but uh -huh. not the DVT. Probably, and you know, we give it for the cardiac risk. Yeah. 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 Anything, Dr. Yadav, you want to add anything? Yeah. Sir, uh, I continue. Uh, uh, I, uh, similar to uh, Dr. Sandeep, I used uh, Clexen. Uh, intro in the OT, I use cyclocapron, that is uh, trigamic acid, single shot, one hour before the surgery, just 15 minutes before the surgery. And that's not DVT prophylaxis. Uh, for uh, preventing the blood loss. Okay. And, uh, okay. but we are asking about DVT prophylaxis. Yeah, I follow it with uh, uh, Clexane, uh, subcutaneously 40 unit in uh, young patients and uh, 60 unit in uh, comorbid patients. And I, uh, after discharge, I put them for three to six weeks on uh, oral uh, uh, anticoagulants like uh, Xeralto or Rivaroxaban. 
And sure. if okay. patient I is only yeah. equals sure. strain, then I continue with that. I don't add uh, Zeralto or any other anticoagulants. If he sure. is a comorbid, then I continue with his equals strain. Any, 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 anybody else? Sir, Doctor Gagan Sachdeva is there, sir. Sorry. Doctor Gagan Sachdeva is there, sir. Yeah, Doctor Gagan. Anything to add? What sir, already been said? Sir, sir he is finding his uh, single is finding some difficulty. So okay. Yeah. So can I just add one more thing? Uh, yeah, just let me let him finish, uh, Garbanda, Doctor Gagan. Can he? We can't see him. Sir, he's trying to get uh, opening the uh, link. Sir, okay, go on, Garbanda. We'll come back to you. So, so what I think is, you know, we are all using our own, uh, you know, whatever we read and whatever we believe in and sure, whatever sure. our experiences. I think in UK, I know uh, some of our colleagues. They tell me that uh, they have a policy. The hospital has a policy, which yeah, that's important. Every, everybody, you know, gives the same thing, whether it's a oral or whether it's a clexane or whether it's ecosprin. And on top of that, a uh, concern or uh, a surgeon has to, you know, modify slightly based on the risk factors. Sure. So I think that uh, we should all have one policy of our own hospital, sure. Sure. and I think. Uh, last uh, IA, you know, the book that uh, was given, it has given a very good uh, this thing about DVT profile axis that we should follow. Yeah, yeah. absolutely right, Karban Because say the DVT profile axis should be there. We should follow. If you don't follow, it's illegal, and you can be sued. Patients have sued doc surgeons successfully for not following the protocol. You have to have the protocol. Whether you give clexane or uh, chemo prophylaxis is not. Um, um, essential, but you have to have a DVT prophylactic, like oh, early mobilization, uh, uh, DVT uh, stockings, uh, baloney stockings, uh, or pumps, whatever you say. And my policy is, we have a policy, um, as you know, there are mild, moderate, high risk group, ABC. Mild, I do not use any chemical prophylaxis, no clexane. Moderate, based on my medical advice, I might use it. For all high risk, I use chemical prophylaxis. Remaining patients, early mobilization, stockings for six weeks, and foot pumps for the during surgery and immediate post op because most of the patients are mobilized on day one or, or on the same day. Um, I think this is uh, I think well well accepted and uh, as you, I was uh, talking to UK colleagues that's that's what they follow. You don't have to give chemical prophylaxis to protect yourself. You have to have a policy, a written policy. You write it down and you are. Well protected if you're talking about legal things. And uh, about catheter, I was talking. So if at all I use epidural catheter, if fem femoral sometimes not affect you, I give a gap of 12 hours. So okay. I start next following day. If I do today, of 12 hours gap, we start clexane or whatever, one of those things. I need to stop 12 hours before you take catheter out and continue. And the duration also, I think, not very clear because... You might have seen one of the surgeon in UK was successfully sued for a PE because the one of the chemical prophylaxis not continued six weeks as is indicated on the leaflet, only given for three to four weeks. So we are not sure about the duration, but I think two weeks is minimum. Sometimes high risk, you may have to continue for longer. Yeah. But don't uh, don't, uh, don't American Academy uh, people for knees. They give yeah. and they give aspirin for six weeks. I think that was that was in the past, but now I think uh, the aspirin is no longer considered as a DVT prophylaxis in UK or America. You are not protected for a DVT prophylaxis if you just give aspirin. So aspirin is not a DVT prophylaxis. So Maybe for, some some you, other reason. Yeah. What do you what do you give for knees? I I see most of the knees. I only high risk patients. I give clexane. Clexane for six yes. weeks. Two weeks, two to three weeks. Most of the time, they're mobilized. I don't use six weeks, mm. only two weeks for high risk, mild, moderate risk. I do not give any any chemical. Only they have physical means and early mobilization. So uh, various studies with the newer anticoagulants, especially with Eliquis, Apixaban, and yeah. the Zarelto, that is Rivaroxaban, they yeah. have suggested that the DVT prophylaxis should be continued in hip cases for six weeks yeah, because yeah. after the patient has been discharged from the hospital they have developed pe or maybe signs of dvt yeah sure and sanjeev most of these protocol are done by company people company people yeah. physicians 
Yeah. None of them are done by orthopedic surgeons. Absolutely. And, so and what it. happens is because we are following, even American surgeons do not follow American law. Just physicians. Right. They right. have their own protocol, hospital Absolutely. policy. You have to have a policy. Yeah. And you can do whatever policy says. You have to stick to the policy and you document it. According to our hospital, this is our hospital policy. That's what we have done. Okay. Yeah. Next right. one is, I think a lot of controversy, I think recently one of my... Well, my younger colleague was sued in Calcutta because of uh, simultaneous total knee replacement um, in few years ago. Who just wanted opinion about staged versus uh, um, single simultaneous uh, bilateral TKR. Starting with uh, Sanjeev, can you yeah. give your opinion? I, I don't see you? anything wrong in doing simultaneous bilateral TKR because that is yeah. mostly almost eighty percent of my cases are bilateral TKRs. Yeah. It all depends on the proper uh, uh, what, what, the preoperative assessment of the patient, especially the cardiopulmonary function is very important for me. The ASA yeah. grade, that is very important. So yeah. in those scenario, we have to see, uh, especially if the patient is uh, extremely elderly, maybe above 70, I would prefer to do a single uh, stage, single, uh, single uh, ipsilateral care. Uh, or if it is less than 70, I would have more inclination to do bilateral, but after uh, preoperatively assessing the patient thoroughly. And sure. seeing the cardiopulmonary status is important for that. And that is basically the clearance from the anesthesia side as well as the cardiologist. Yeah. I think there anything to add? Well, I've always done, uh, I mean, I've till today I've been doing 50% of my cases bilateral, but yeah. if I was given a choice, I would do single for every patient. And yeah. Surely, single should be given, done for all the patients, as you said earlier. Not, I mean, patients should not be more than seventy. Should have a decent cardiopulmonary function. Should not have a, a creatinine of more than one point six, and should have other parameters within, uh, you know, uh, ASA grade one or two. So, sure. but I, I'm, you know, as I think I'm, as I'm getting older. Now I'm senior citizen club, so uh, <laughs> which you are already. So I'm feeling, you know, that I, I, it's more stress for me to do bilateral. I, I mean, I would always love to do, and I've seen that the patient also does better with one side, uh, yeah. provided of probably course. Not you, should, you should take your uh, good assistant, probably your colleague, doing one side, and you do the one side. I, that's what I do. Rather, I do I have two on either side. I just <coughs> do cuts both sides and leave. They do the rest of the job so probably you have to have a way to do bilateral because sometimes young patients doing bilateral on the same day i mean so it's a, i feel it is yeah, advantageous cost cutting yes. and it's so sometimes easy rehabilitation because whether single and bilateral it's one operation when cardiothoracic surgeon can do 10 hours operation neurosurgeon can do 10 hour operation why can't we do two hour operation that's it's a, it's yeah. one operation we're doing. It's only one operation. We're doing two knees together. That's the concept. I think uh, presently there is evidence to say we can, we can, there's no legal problem in doing bilateral provided like any other surgery, you should make sure the patient is fit for both knee operations. Yeah. And uh, I don't think we should worry. We, sometimes I do after 70 provided they are fit. Uh, those people, I do one, wait, and do the... I do not inflate the two tunic at the same time. One, then the next one. Um, so I don't think we should worry. The, the, the reason, I should say, the reason in America, they don't do two because insurance pays only one. In America, in the UK, they pay the second operation 50%. Even in India, if you do two, in some of the insurance, especially GIPSA, they pay only half for the second operation. That's one of the reasons. Some of the countries they do not do advocate doing two operations in a single say single sitting. Yeah, anything, Gagan and Ramesh Babu, if you have anything to add, you there? Uh, Doctor Gagan is finding a bit of challenge, sir. Sure, okay, he's... no problem. I think we will leave him probably. Yeah. Dr. Ramesh Babu. I think yeah. he is also not. I think next one, I think probably. Um, we, we take one topic on uh, um, hip. The head size, I think we're always discussing just for the benefit of uh, um, our audience. So if Pradeep is around, I would ask uh, the question to him. Pradeep, are you there? Yeah. If you can yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Video as well. Yeah. So what is the standard? Because uh, what is the standard message we should give to the 
audience? What is the standard size? Any advantage having a large head or small head? Yeah, there's a definitely advantage of using 28 and more size. 22 yeah. is gone out of uh, the thing, uh, yeah. stability wise. Uh, so bigger the size, better the stability. That is big. But not one. too big. But up to 36. Yeah. Beyond 36 is no uh, benefit. That is an international standard. Sure. So 36 sure. is the upper size. Yeah. But for that, cup size is also <laughs> important. So everything depends on the cup size. The thickness of the poly or whatever has to be good as per the standardized uh, implant uh, company uh, design. You know. Yeah. So larger size definitely better. Depending so you would advocate. 28, 32, or 36, based yes, on the true. established size. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, a, that's what most of the time, because if you do a, a pinnacle, uh, most of the time it's decided by a setabular. If you ream up to 54, they say, or 56, yeah. 58, whatever size. But uh, too big, there's no point in keep reaming a setabular. When you get good uh, stability, anterior posterior stability, there's no true. point in reaming more just to accommodate a big size head. Would you agree true. with that? True. Yes. Karbanda, anything to add? 32 for me. 32, okay. And I'm not worried about dislocation. And if I'm worried about dislocation, then I'll use a dual mobility. Yeah. Sanjeev? Yeah, the same. 32 is uh, ideal for me. Uh, the only thing that is I am basically, uh, the, it's decided by the size of the uh, cup, that acetabular yes. cup. Is more than 54, yes. then oh, I would 30. probably go for 36 also. Yeah, because the cup, you know, the highly crosslink poly that you're using, in that seven is the minimum or six is the minimum yeah uh, you know so six millimeter thickness so six plus six twelve and then if you are using 32 or 36 also uh, most of the cups you will have 48 size at least sure dr yadav anything to add you can unmute yourself continuously there's no point stay muted oh, sir, um, i usually unmute. go with i usually go with 32 sir but in younger patients i i do go uh, aim for higher uh, larger diameter i think i think the evidence says if you stay between 28 to 36 the results are good longevity is good if you're too small i think most of the most of us do not do 22 unless there's a reason in case of dual mobility or in case of uh, Bipolar hip, small hip, maybe do, but Australian, I think Australian registry is showing 36 having a bit more wear and tear. But I think uh, maybe 28 to uh, 32 is ideal, but 28 yeah. to 36 is acceptable. That's mm -hmm. the. Yeah. And one more thing, I think a lot of discussions about PS and CR. And I don't think there's any point in discussing it because both are equally good and mm -hmm. both two are different operations. Um, any quick comment on this one? PS and CR. Sanjeev? So I am basically a 100% PS surgeon, so nothing to comment there. I, I think it should be training dependent. I have yes. always been trained in PS and yes. I have always done PS. And I, I can tell you a lot of my colleagues, even in India or abroad, uh, they are still doing PS. Even, they are, even when they are big shots, they are still doing PS because they have been trained in doing that. Absolutely. So I think training is very important and don't change just for the sake of, uh, you know, changing. So the yeah. results are same. Both the results are same. But if, yes, I also agree with the same. Both works. So whatever you are doing, if you do yeah. properly, it has got a equal role. So there is no better than other, you know. Your surgery has to be perfect as per the guidelines. Yeah. The only Dr. problem, Yadav, the mm -hmm. only problem mm -hmm. is... Yes, only, sir. Same. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, yeah Karbanda, you wanted the to say. The only problem is when you're using a very small size for yeah, PS. I was. That is the only problem where you can just, uh, you know, the condyle can. Uh, so if you're worried about that, just put a step. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think you know, for me, I think same works because uh, the, these are two operations. Uh, easier to do PS because you only two ligaments to balance. And the CR, of course, people are expert. They're difficult to uh, speak to Rajagopal. He does uh, very severely deformed with the. Uh, um, CR yeah. and uh, probably he, get, he, he gets good results but I don't think there is any discussion two operations are equally good provided you do well and uh, you should not, uh, my request for the audience is do not keep changing between these two don't do one case PS, other case uh, CR, you stick to one procedure one system and continue so that you can expert like in a hip, there's no point in keep changing your approaches, stick to one approach and be Expert in that approach. 
Yeah, I think we'll stop that one uh, discussion. Hinge one, because nowadays uh, what happened, more and more revisions are coming, more and more uh, difficult cases coming. Um, Karbanda, what, what are, can you tell me a few indications for a hinge knee? Well, I would do hinge knee when there is, uh, most important is when there's no ligament, uh, medial and lateral ligament uh, stability, or the condyles are deficient okay. along with the ligament uh, instability. Or the second thing is when there's a hyperextension problem, and the yeah. third, when probably there's a neuropathic problem. Uh, yes. So I would do probably hinged in that. Uh, PS, uh, I mean, TS, TS or TC3, uh, I don't, uh, I, it has shown more or less uh, 15 year good results uh, as compared to a uh, unconstrained also. So sure. I'm quite okay to use uh, TCTS, but hinge I would use in these three or four indications. Yeah. Any Anyone different? Yeah. Uh, whenever there's a MCL deficiency, um, hinge is a must because that gives a very good uh, effect, stability. Second indication in primary is whenever, as you said, there's a hyperextension deformity. Soft yeah. tissue, hyperextension, laxity, posterior sure. laxity. Uh, that has to be treated with um, hinge knee. Yeah. Uh, well, Pradeep, uh, recently, I mean, not recently, I keep revising for hyperextension deformity. People have done primary without yeah. understanding the mechanics. Um, so it's uh, the message for the audience is you have to be very careful in a lax hyperextension knee because they're mm -hmm. more difficult to do than a severely flexed Deformity or a various deformity, valgus deformity. Hyperextension knee, you have to be very careful. Balancing is very, very important. Otherwise, you will be in trouble. Um, one very important factor is that today's rotating hinge knees are doing very well, unlike yeah. the fixed. So, results are, so, I have some uh, patients with 10 to 12 years follow up doing very well, primary uh, knee for RA. So, yeah, there should be low threshold using a hinge. Yes, rotating true, hinge. true. Yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, dual mobility. We'll start with you, Pradeep. Indications for dual mobility. Um, whenever there's an instability, dual mobility has a very important role to prevent dislocation. But one issue of longevity is still because there are two levels like... Um, so I'm not very fond for using every case. Only selected revisions, it is uh, useful. Not for every case, but dual mobility definitely helps for instability. Longevity is an issue. Yeah. Dr. Karbanda? Uh, as he said, only for uh, to prevent dislocations. And uh, so basically in cases where there are tocantric fractures, non-unions, uh, where uh, there is a deficiency of abductor mechanism due to any reason, I would do dual mobility. Not for uh, longevity. So anything, anything to add, Sanjeev? Uh, in, especially in Parkinson patients, some somebody who is uh, like uh, neurological disorders, I would prefer to do dual mobility. And uh, there are some papers which have shown that fracture neck femurs they do well with dual mobility, but I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. Yadav, Dr. Yadav, anything Same to add? Yeah. No, okay, I think that's right. I think very good. there's nothing to add. Probably dual mobility, probably. I'm using more and more dual mobility because I'm doing more and more revisions for uh, mm -hmm. instability. Uh, when you think about uh, doing a revision for instability, especially when revising in a dislocated hip, THR already dislocated for so many months or uh, long duration, um, I don't feel um, normal reconstruction will help. Straight away, I'll go for dual mobility. True. Pradeep. Yes, absolutely true. Okay. You are more at... Uh, Ease, you can sleep peacefully. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because uh, it, it's, it's dislocated, it's, it's, there's no point in rectifying <laughs> things. It's difficult to understand what went wrong in that situation. You have already dislocated hips, so it's safer, especially they are elderly. Most of these are elderly people. Of course, young people, we have to save the hip and do a standard uh, um, hip replacement. But uh, the older people, most of them are. Uh, Bipolar or hemiarthroplasty is dislocated, left dislocated. Uh, one people. more indication: Do you prefer to do uh, use the dual mobility, especially you have a spinopelvic, uh, uh, maybe a deformity or uh, fusion? In those scenario, do you prefer to do a dual mobility, ankylosed situation? Uh, previously, I have not used it. 
and uh, if you do it properly results are good but again there is a role definitely if you are started doing and if you are not comfortable definitely dual mobility has a role we are, we are not sure about the antiversion and inclination yes. angle so better to do a dual mobility in that those type True. of scenario yes it has got a role so with dual mobility now in uh, a lot of uh, practice is there any role of hinged <laughs> Pardon? Constraint, constraint hip. Yeah, the indication for constraints are very par particular. You know? yeah. On the table, if you find instability and the trochanter is gone, uh, you must have a. That's a one of the biggest indication where you should reconstruct the trochanter and use a constraint implant. Constraint elderly patient with the uh, elderly patient with neurological involvement. And sometimes the trochanteric uh, problem and intraoperative, you see there's an instability. These are the good indication. And even the dual mobility also gives the equal. Uh, so there's a. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I think in the next one is about stem cells. We discussed quite a bit about the stems in uh, total knee replacements. Um, anything to add? Stem, I think one uh, controversy is size of the stem. Um, um, Sanjeev, how do you decide the, the length of the stem, no, not the size, the length of the stem? Yeah, basically, it's not that the, the longer the stem, the better the result. It's not uh, always that. Again, uh, we are mostly dictated by the companies that we follow. See, I'm more of a Smith & Nephew guy and sometimes in and, in and outs I do, sometimes strikers, sometimes, but mostly 90% of my cases are Smith & Nephew. So mm -hmm. I am dictated by the company that I am following. And so nowadays, what, what is the scientific the, reason? How do you decide so what length you, you, you want to use? Uh, it is basically, it's not, uh, I would prefer the smaller uh, stems rather than the longer ones. Okay. And I try to uh, go to the diaphysis. It's not exactly that I have to go through and through and so to sure. remit. So you want a three point fixation. That's what you want. Yeah. 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 Um, I think uh, the general principle of the stem is use a so shorter stem, you shorter want to use stem. a cemented one. Use a longer stem, you can use uncemented. But uh, the, the whole idea is you should have a three point fixation starting from the top tibial plateau. And uh, especially osteoporotic bone graft, when you use wedge, you must use a stem. Otherwise, it is going to collapse. Basic principle. And more often, you need a tibial stem. Most of the time, you get away with the femur, but tibia is not uh, uh, forgivable. So you must use a stem. If it's osteoporotic, if you think osteoporotic, especially rheumatoid post-fracture, severe deformity, defect, and uh, when you have a uh, um, well, fracture, of course, intra, um, intra-articular fracture, stress fractures. Yeah. Anything to add, Karbanda? No, about stems? That's it. I think some people use for uh, all, uh, you know, obese people as well. Yeah, okay. Right. So, I think... Uh, yeah. So we have one query from the attendees. So yeah. if you can address that one query. Yeah. Lakshmi, can you just... Uh, yeah. Uh, where is the chart? I can't see in the chat box. What is that? So that's coming uh, out. From sir, the... uh, doctor, I would like to uh, read it out for you. Yeah. Read it out. I can't see. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Uh, so the query is from uh, Sadulwar Vijay Kumar. What mm -hmm. is the minimum duration nature takes to develop osteoarthritis in DDH as per your experience and as per the natural history of disease since diagnosis with the reference to disease um, general of orthoplasty globally? Follow up protocol for TKR in your three cases. Sure. Uh, I think uh, Pradeep, would you like to answer that question? How long does it take to develop arthritis in a DDH? I think a million dollar question. Yeah. So basically, once you become adult, after completion of the growth plate, about 18 to 20, that is a time your activity starts and uh, you start getting the osteoarthritis uh, after 18 to 20. So about five years to 10 years, they start getting symptoms after your completion of growth plate. So 18 years to complete and then five to 10 years, you start getting symptoms. Very gradual. And pain is the most important thing. So, uh, pain is the most important thing, limp and pain. These are the two things. 
which and attracts also, it them. Also, it also depends upon what is the severity of the DDH, yes. whether it's a treated, whether it's a contained head, how much is containment, and these these factors will help um, to develop. Some people, I mean, as you rightly said, I think probably 30s, they may go to 40s. So yes. third, fourth decade, they might get uh, um, intervention. They develop even pseudo acidabulum. And after that, they start getting the degenerative changes. But pain and limb are the most important factor which they come for surgery. Yeah. And then the second part, what was the Jyoti? What was the second part Actually, of the question? Actually, uh, what was the second part of the question? I can't see that, sir. Uh, so the question is, uh, I received only one question, and the question, yeah. the second part is. Um, uh, with uh, follow up protocol for TKR in your three cases. Which three cases? Whose three cases? So, this was addressed to three cases by uh, uh, Dr. I, Dr. Dutch, uh, Dr. I think Dr. Akhil Arora. Dr. I think so. Akhil Dr. Akhil Arora. Uh, Dr. Yes. Arora, are you there? Dr. Arora has gone. No, he's not, not there. Not there. No issues. So I, I think if the protocol, I think if you use the general principles would be if you use a bone graft, you have to protect it weight bearing. If you use a stem with uh, metal augments, uh, there's no, or they can tolerate, uh, I mean, weight as, as the pain uh, tolerates. So only question of non-weight bearing is when you use bone, uh, more bone grafts. Otherwise, uh, post-operative protocol is uh, like a conventional, I mean, it's a routine, uh, total, total knee replacement. Yeah. I think... Uh, if there's nothing else to discuss, I will hand over back to Jyoti and Odit. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, after strict uh, time utterance, still we went way beyond the time. Uh, yes. I would like to thank you, our uh, eminent chairperson, Dr. Uh, KJ Reddy, sir, uh, mm -hmm. for his wonderful discussion and uh, wonderful question in the panel. And uh, all the panelists, they discussed very well. And it was useful for everyone. I would like to thank all the consultants uh, for, for wonderful case presentation and their uh, surgical uh, technique presentation. Uh, I, I think as sir suggested, uh, next time it will be physical meeting only. We will not miss our uh, Hyderabadi biryani. Uh, so for conclusion, for concluding remarks, I would hand over to uh, Lakshmi Priya or to Lakshmi. Uh, thank you, Jyoti, and thank you, Dr. K.G. Reddy. Uh, so I'm Lakshmi Priya, associated with the marketing team of DRL. Thanks to all, our, all the dignitaries for joining today's third edition of Forum. And all the presentations and discussion have indeed been momentous. We would like to have future association with you as well. Uh, once again, thanks on behalf of Dr. Reddy's team for your precious time on weekend and uh, disseminating your knowledge and experience through Forum. Thank you. Thank you once again. And somehow my video is not opening <laughs> thank you thank, thank you. you everyone thank you thanks thanks thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. team as well as all the faculty my colleagues and the audience we will see you next thank year thank you very thank much. you have a safe thank, thank you very much bye sir bye sir take good care. night Cheers. good night sir bye good night recording stopped Thank you.